welcome to Flat Earth Debate, Uncut and After Show. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are premiering. There's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Guns of Navarone, RMP, Troy Shuka, Bo's Nail, Justin Duso, Joseph Pizarro, Samson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, NA Literalist, Maria Nealand, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, Nathan Thompson, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Liam Nedrick, Owen Jennisons, Abraham Mohammed, Dave Rakia Gafford, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic 936, Life is Short, Fireball X, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson, Kirsten Smith, Alexander Main, David Wayne Foster, and Dank. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I'm going to raise the mic on whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. So i got to give you credit for that. But I, I kind of felt bad for him. He didn't have to come. Nobody asked. Well, Nathan Thompson asked him to come. <laughs> Blame Nathan Thompson. Yeah, I wish you would have hammered him more. It doesn't. I said this five, four or five times in the shows following that. It, it doesn't matter who you are. If you come here and you present your case with the fundamentalist religious belief, it's going to get ripped to shreds. It doesn't matter who you are. You're like, oh, but it's Witsy. I feel bad for it. Oh. Well, he didn't, no, I didn't twist his arm to come here, did I? No, he came, he came in fully confident to defend his position. Then he cut, sort of flipped when uh, once Rumpus was calling his name and saying Witsy is right, then he like quickly tried to retract from it. That's a dirty but mirror he held up, isn't it? What's that? Again, John? I said that was a dirty mirror that Rumpus held up, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that you got to hand it to Rumpus. <laughs> he knows which angle to exploit, right? <laughs> Morning, morning. Hey, Redman. How y'all doing today? Mighty fine. Pretty good. How was your holiday? Nice. You all have a nice Christmas? Yeah, I stepped on a Lego. Lego. <laughs> stepped on a Lego. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I hate it. Yeah. God, I don't deal with little toys anymore. Yeah, my five-year-old. Like a die. My kids are expensive. One kid's into music, the other one's into guns, and a little guy's into video games. Well, they're all into the video games, so my, my Christmases are very expensive. Okay, Neil. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. You all know what to say when you got to shell out almost eight hundred dollars for a video game. No, Over a thousand dollars for a bass guitar. When your kids reach that age, you'll see. The thousand dollars for a bass guitar I can get behind. Because there's a good chance, well, not a good chance, but there's a chance that that will remain with that person for a very long period of time if they get into it and are successful and it becomes a tool. And if they don't, you could always resell it. Unlike the games well, no, console, which will be worthless within 12 months. 
Yeah, well, he's, he is really getting good on the bass guitar. Very proud of him. Learning by himself. Anyway. I don't see it as a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. You know, you can take your time, get away from the world, just enjoy life itself. You know, it's a good thing to learn how to play an instrument, learn how to draw, something like that. Do something constructive. Other than that, Earth is still flat. It's been that way. <laughs> Did you get into it, any of you, over the Christmas dinner table, so to speak? I do have an interesting story about it. I was doing an outage in uh, Ohio at the steel mill, and... Uh, there was a group of iron workers standing around talking about flat earth. And one of them said your name. No your, way. Hold on. Said your name. Said your name. Who's no, it back? said Nathan Oakley. I think that's Neil. Neil, whatever you're doing, stop. You're feeding back really badly. So I don't know how you're listening to us, but it's causing a lot of feedback. Neil, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm on mute. No, but when you're not, you're causing feedback, is what I'm saying. I don't know if you're too okay. close to speakers or something, but yeah, or just turn down whatever you're listening to on, because you can hear it. Sorry, what what were you saying, John? Someone called your name. No, no, they they said your name. And My name? The, like I heard, yeah. What? There was like five guys, yeah, there was five guys standing around, like, you know, talking about flat earth. I mean, they weren't talking about it like it was flat, but... And then I heard somebody say something about Nathan Oakley, but, you know, I didn't, the subject changed by the time I was able to stop what I was doing and get over there. But I thought that was interesting. Mm, okay. Good to know, I suppose. <laughs> There's somebody in Mansfield, Ohio listening to you. Yeah, it would kind of makes sense if that conversation comes up, then why wouldn't they have heard of me, I suppose. Running a show daily, it means people are going to have heard of it, right? It's going to hopefully come up. You know? <laughs> I, want that. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing that I'm on people's lips when they mention Flat Earth, but that's fine by me. You know, Great if it could get me to 20,000 subscribers. <laughs> Well, I talk about you all the time on my construction site, so I, I don't see it uncommon. And word is getting around. I mean, believe it or not, Clarence is spoken of in many, many places. Good morning. Hey, Tenth. Have a good Christmas. Very good Christmas. It was wonderful. The grandkids were wild, like it should be. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Hey, Neil, good morning. Good morning, Tim. So, what's the topic, you guys? I jumped in. Flat Earth is being spoken everywhere. No, John just mentioned that my name got mentioned. <laughs> that was all. Well, that's on a regular basis, I would think. No, a construction site. John heard Nathan Oakley's name mentioned on a construction site. Oh, like, like that's the oddest thing that could ever happen well i mean it's just odd that i watch the show pretty much daily and then i hear someone talking about it you know it was kind of odd well uh in today's technology where the guy's working with an earpiece tied to his phone listening to any podcast he wants it's kind of regular i think you know tent it is not. It's not like it's on ABC or NBC. I said podcast. I know, but I'm saying Flat Earth Debate is not on freaking uh, ABC TV in America. Every TV station, every show on Earth is on the Flat Earth. So everything's on Flat Earth. Oh, I got you. 
the plane anyway. Well, and no, I heard you almost slipped the other day and said planet. I did. <laughs> Say again, John. It's not that they were talking about flat Earth, you know, like I've heard that before. It was the fact that, you know, Nathan's name was mentioned that surprised me. But I was, you know, like kind of in a bind with a uh, instrument I was working on, so I couldn't, I couldn't hear more, you know. Yeah, I think uh, one day Nathan's going to be walking by a construction site and hear his own name mentioned. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nathan Oakley. Well, Get him. <laughs> go ahead, Nathan. Let me hear the comment, the adverb. <laughs> you mean they're not just going to whistle? You're talking about. I think it's strange if you're talking about flat Earth and you don't hear Nathan Oakley's name. Uh -huh. There we go. That's the spirit. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Whoever said that, I do have a beautiful ass. Yeah, I thought they always oh. whistled when he walked past you guys. <laughs> Oh, here we go. The show's <laughs> descending already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Nathan, for your New Year's resolution, you got to stop being a degenerate. Yeah. Come on, we get more subscribers if we get off the construction side, get out of the school zones. You stop being a degenerate. What the, the hell? They want you to go to schools and yell at kids or something, I think they said. I've lo I'm lost in <laughs> no, this conversation. I've, I don't know where you're going with this or what you mean. Explain yourself, Neil. I you called yourself a degenerate uh, about twenty shows ago. Uh, how dare you? <laughs> I think you'll find I called myself a pervert. Oh yeah, same thing. Not pervert. at all. Excuse how me. dare you? How very, very dare you? <laughs> I meant pervert. How dare you call a degenerate a pervert? <laughs> Either way around. How dare you call a pervert a degenerate? <laughs> my God. Oh my gosh. This is I mean, that is me, uh, to me, uh, right on guys. It just sounds. We all need repentance. The Judean people's front all over again. <laughs> Perverts are the ones I'm actually. worried about. Perverts. Curverts, indeed. No, nah, that was a good one. Curverts. I like that one. Wow, yeah, nice segue. that's on a level <laughs> you quitted me. Yeah, that got up there. Well, now that we got that out of the way. Yeah, there's the ether war to talk about. What ether war? Yeah, the whole idea that there's a downward vector is somehow, this is yet to be explained to me, connected to ether. Now, that connection's not been made yet. Maybe it'll come up and it'll be non-sequitur like the last thing that was used to claim we've got a bias downwards. I don't know. But this is being labelled 10th, the ether wars. Now, don't ask me why. I don't get it. Do you get it? Anybody else? Ex explain to me why it's being connected to ether. Well, prior to this no. show... Go on, go on, Chad. I'll tell you why, because uh, it's it has being pushed by Bob and Bob Nodell and Witcher gets it. They're both Ether boys. That's a who, not a why. I I think I can answer that. Yeah, uh, John. It it's a <laughs> it's a roundabout way of not having a container. Because if the ether is containing the gas, that means there's another medium for it to press upon. Yeah, but that'd still be a container. Contain it's still containing it, even if it's temperature or frequency, sound. Uh, a, a container still a container. No matter what you're calling that, if it's holding, if it's a medium holding another medium, it's a container to that medium. So oh, which, ether is not. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This makes no sense. No, no, no. If, if you're, if you're ass asserting that there's a downward bias, that would be at least in globe head logic, and a, re a reason to assert no need for container, gas is going down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank. So therefore the downward bias is the legitimization of there being gas here without a container on the globe side. So, so why is there a requirement for ether? It still doesn't connect together for me. Maybe it's just me. Oh, probably because Einstein read about it and said there needs to be ether in space, maybe because he's a retard. Yeah, but they don't abide, abide by Einstein on the globuster side of this argument, do they? 
In fact, they use that like we do when we say relative. When we say the word relative, they say, ah, you mean Einstein. It's like, no, no, not relativity. Well, it's an equivocation anyway, but that's usually what it comes down to in the argument. Equivocating what what are they describing that's being equivocated? So I still don't know. They're trying to describe space. Say again. I think they're trying to describe what space is. They're just calling it fucking ether, and and why? I don't know. So they want to keep. They want to retain the idea of having a space. Yeah. And they just want to juxtapose the word space with the word ether. Right. They want to switch it and then change them. Uh, I think it's just a way for humans to describe a medium, but you know. I'm not the one that wrote it down. So. Fine. Out of space is fake. You can't have gas pressure without a container. I thought their rebuttal to that was, well, gas go down, go boom, boom. And now you're saying, well, also ether. Is it just like a bit of one, a bit of the other, add in a bit of magical medium, add in a bit of assumption of downward bias? Is that what this is? Just a melting pot of nonsense? Just a melting pot yeah. of nonsense. Yes, sir. That's why it's an incoherent bias. <laughs> incoherent because it doesn't make any sense, you mean? Yeah, none of, none of the arguments just kind of slapped together with, you know, super glue and toothpaste. That's a, a quote I got from a, it's now been torn down, but there was a very, very high end car dealership around the corner from me, like literally stone's throw. And uh, he had a, a Lamborghini in there one day and I went in, I was like, wow, V12 Lambo, mm, I'll have a look at that. So I went in and I spoke to the dealer and I'm like, mind if I have a look at the Lamborghini? And he's like, yeah, no problem. Do you want to look inside the engine bay? I was like, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. So he opens up the bonnet, as we call it, and shows me inside. And it, there's all these carbon fiber panels and stuff. I go, wow, it looks pretty neat, eh? He goes, no, no, no. He lifts one of the panels <laughs> and there's like zip ties. He goes, this is this Italian under the skin he says it's held together with zip ties and dreams <laughs> I thought that was a great quote <laughs> held together with zip ties and dreams well so far in this conversation we've talked within the begging the question of ether so let's first prove ether what, what is it it's the, <laughs> first show it me and then the, we'll you know we'll know what it is because we'll know what it is right what is it right well, the best I can glean from the people I've spoken to is it is the non-physical physical. Uh, that's seriously the best I've gotten. What? A contradiction in terms? Yes. If you take everything out of a jar, ether is left. If you have a jar of nothing, that's ether. Yeah. That's, that's what Interesting. I've got. Interesting. Okay, now I, I get the connection with that because they want some, they, they need a medium for light to propagate through as a wave, right? So are they now relabeling a vacuum in ether? Yes, everything's in ether. You just uh, it's, we just it's had. Sorry, uh, John. Sleeping warrior's arrived, and he will be able to shed light on this question. Hey, sleeping warrior. Hey, what's the question? Why is it being called quote ether wars? What the hell? Not what's ether? Although that is a question we're on to right now. But why? Well, how is this idea of a downward bias? labeled ether war it makes no sense to me what what's the connection i didn't realize there was an equivalent argument for the downwards direction that isn't there compared to ether where's that come from i don't know that's why i'm asking and maybe i was wrong anthony will not be able to shed some light on this either okay fair enough first of it first okay. of it i've never heard it being described as an ether war before well yeah. john share your jar when you take everything out of a jar see what anthony says Okay, yeah, it's uh, ether is the non-physical, physical, if you empty out a jar, ether is left. But the, the non-physical, physical? Yeah, yep, that, that's what I've been able to glean. Pure capability so in a jar. Yeah, that sounds like, <laughs> sounds like a contradiction of the law of non-contradiction, that. Yeah, when you point that out, they tell you you're just not listening to the entire argument. Okay, then. No, well, I'm glad we no, cleared that no up. Comment. <laughs> Clarity has been shed. No comment, I suppose, is the answer to that one. I have. I don't see the equivalence, to be honest. 
Yeah, I don't get it either. But apparently, from what we before you got here, it seems that there's just a whole cluster screw of nonsense thrown in a big mixing pot. So is this ether that's left in the jar? Is it measurable? No, just no. It's not physical. It, but it's physical. So, <laughs> so it's like it's it's much like the geometric horizon. You can't see it, but it's there. No, it's more like conceptual medium of space time and it being bent you know it's not a physical medium in the respect that it's only existent in conceptual mathematics but that non-physical medium is being bent to develop the conceptual space time causing this gravity concept to be a physical thing i mean it's not a force but you can think of it as a force you know that sort of thing it's much more like that okay it's so exactly then maybe like space that. time is ether too so ether bent the ether's like space time, by the sounds of things. Yes, but we're so the it can't be validated scientifically. No, but we're the ether is kind of the, I guess the religious position of the people arguing the downward bias. I think that's why it's called the ether wars. Effects get validated scientifically. Let's just get that clear. Not everything requires scientific validity so so some things just are descriptions of things and that doesn't require science now a phenomenon something occurring in nature something happening and you looking at that thing happening and going what causes that for example the big yellowy orange light in the sky yeah that's a phenomenon something occurring in nature you go wow now you can give it a description based on just so stories about what you think it's doing in a sky vacuum, that would be the sun. But it's still just something occurring in nature and you don't know what's causing it. So science would be open to in the inquiry of what is that light in the sky? Yeah, What causes that? That's a scientific question or a, an inquiry open to scientific method. So it's not about just, well... What's ether? Well, have you got scientific evidence for it? Well, what's happening? Is is ether something happening? Because if it was something happening, then fine. Validating the cause of what's happening would be something open to scientific inquiry. Now, if it's just something that you're describing, what is it? Show it me. As opposed to empty out a jar when there's nothing in you left with ether. That makes no sense. How can they show you non-physical? Well, if you're going to describe something, you've got to be describing something. It doesn't be, have to be something even happening. Now, you can describe things that are just happening without establishing the cause either. Again, not necessarily requiring science, unless you wanted to know the cause of it. Then you'd put it through the scientific method. But not everything requires scientific validity, is what I'm saying. You know, if you just got something and you just want to describe it, you can just describe it. But you've got to actually have something to describe first. <laughs> you know, not the so, lack so thereof. <laughs> All right, so when Witsit says, okay, it's density for sure is most of it, and this electrostatic is so weak, it's negligible. But he takes the negligible, the very weak that he ascribes to it, and then he uh, matches it with ether, I suppose, in his argument, but he's never shown ether. We've never seen ether. Maybe. I don't know how this attaches, so let's not speculate about what Witsit or anybody else oh, might do question. with their connections. That's a question it's not I'm reasonable. asking. Sorry, go on, Senth. No, that's a question I'm asking. It seems like to me, he says, everything's electrostatic. Everything is positive, negative, you know, everything. I mean, wood, everything. Okay, fine. Now what? And then he, show it to me. Show me how this works. But it's just a theory in the sense, not scientific, but, you know, this is my guess that this is what it is. Okay, fine, guess. Now, where's the proof? How, well, how do like I see it in nature? Well, the downward bias yeah but what about the upward bias according to lemon it's the water that the fish swim in that's how that's their medium and the ether is our medium just try the same trick i tried with sleeping warrior uh, a man who definitely knows the answer to this question has arrived hey sleep <coughs> uh, hey sleeping warrior hey adam meekin hey nathan <laughs> hello <laughs> what question is that well we've got this idea in the community that we find ourselves in labeled the flat earth community that we have this downward bias and for some reason and i don't know what that's my question it's been labeled quote the ether war end quote i don't know why that would be what what connection is there 
car. That that was me being psychic. Um, <laughs> um, the the connection is it's it's all to do with the application of of the scientific method. Um, and whilst gravity is a bit of fun that we tackle with the ballers, there was a label I put there because a year ago, and we you know it, that was the point of contention that I thought as flat earthers would be challenging on by now. So that that's the point that it's a uh, topic of discussion for us flat earthers to chew over. There's two distinct camps, aren't there? They're clear already. Um, but yeah, that's my comprehension of it. So, Adam, are you saying because we destroyed the baller's gravity position, now a certain flat earthers have to come up with something to replace it? No, 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 no. no I'm saying the, the gravity is a, 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 a precursor. I'm saying the ether wars was something that for years I felt brewing. It's a discussion the community, for want of a better phrase, has got to have. Um and I think the foundation, the founding in understanding scientific method, I think most of the community got, you know, now enables us to progress with that. And it's not to say there isn't effects that we're measuring. And no one's denying the effects. Um, I don't think it's necessary to uh, put, put, put it into a causation for uh, why things go down, go boom, boom. Um but I do think it's a separate topic that we'll have a a range of discussions on. You know, it, it, it starts from the basics when we were starting on this journey and not trained in method and, and all sorts of stuff. You, you, The first things you come across are things like Sanyak and um, bits like that. And there's still a question as to what is going off there. Uh, I don't have a problem with investigating it. I just I have a problem with... Qualifying, you know, my opinion on ether is it's, it's it's a flat earther's dark dark matter. It's a place where we can stick our problems, things we observe, and to use it. There, we have to invent a medium that we don't have evidence for. All right. Well, that begs the question: since we have air pressure, uh, we live in a closed system. And so whatever this ether is, if it's even anything, it has to be within a closed system that allows for air pressure to exist. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't think the two are... Um, yeah. Hold on, someone's causing feedback in Discord. Two, two or three of you with your mics wide open. Did someone want to add something? I've got CIA, Redman, and Sinclair. I was going to ask, um, who started the ether idea? Which one of them? <laughs> which one of them? Which one, one of them? Which one of them? Yeah. Mickelson, Gale, like which which one started the idea? You know, Einstein. Which one started the idea? There had to be this ether word because it was you something they didn't understand. In the first before you answer, too, can right? you turn your speakers right down, CIA, because we can hear you feeding back as well. Um, but yes, I don't know who started it. You know, the ether was in existence before Einsteinian nonsense came along. So I don't know if, who invented ether. Anybody on the panel know? I don't think. I think it was a. A convention of ties it's always been it's, it's been manipulated and slightly amended as to what the ether is but an etheric field's been around isn't it yeah. isn't it a necessity if you have a vacuum of space versus if you're in a closed system no i, I no I, I i wouldn't link the two i don't think it's an imaginary concept ether yeah yeah so you can't therefore then say, well, you, you, it has to support gas pressure, this imaginary concept, and by, or it has to disprove it. The two aren't necessarily got any link to each other ne per se, especially considering one's imaginary where we put effects and attribute it to ether. The link that I'm trying to tie it to is the fact that they place the sun at 93 million miles away, and how does that like get to here? Uh, and that distance traveled is via the medium ether. But if you're in an enclosed system, then the sun's also with you in that enclosed system, and there's no need for an ether.
Welcome, Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected, and if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. Now we are joined by Sleeping Warrior, The Adam Meekin, Tenth Man, Neil, and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Morning, morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning from a three-inch snow-covered part of England. Um, did you guys have any snow overnight by any chance? No, I had my mate in Manchester send me a picture of their lovely covering. Three inches Tec we got. Te technical message, Nathan. Your members only mode is on and chat live chat. Yeah, I did that because I couldn't figure out how to turn it off when I scheduled the stream. Typically, I wouldn't schedule a stream on a Monday, but I did. And therefore, it's members only. So lucky old you, members. But nevertheless, I've had a super chat from James Richard, which I'm going to read out before we do the housekeeping questions. Flat Earth versus Globalist. We we're witnessing today is a fight to keep truth hidden in unrighteousness because this truth destroys all kings of Earth. Fair enough. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat. James Richard. Hello. Right, let's, let's do some housekeeping. We'll rattle our way through it. And then we've got a little sleeping warrior presentation, which we'll get to after we've done housekeeping. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge, formerly known as Earth curvature? Not even from a non-physical ether. Now, the horizon's an optical phenomena. It varies with day-to-day, uh, -day, condition to condition. Um, you can't call boats going over the horizon anymore because it's an optical effect. Hold on. If the Earth was a ball, then it would not just be an optical effect. Yeah, but if the Earth's not a ball, then it's an optical effect like it is in real world. And what's your proof for this? Refraction. What? Well, <laughs> no, well, no, not no, refraction. Just, the black swan. Come no, on. Well, just looking at stuff in general. By default, the horizon's not a physical location. Instinctually, and uh, everyone knows this at a base level. The horizon's not physical. But then when you go to the right. Earth curve maths and turn everything inside profile, then suddenly you've got a physical geometric sphere edge that's getting in the way of things. Shout out to Unitox Femu. It's invisible, but it's there. You can think of it as right. being there, Unitox Femu. Thank you for the super chat. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? It all moves in lockstep, so there's no detection of motion, but because of the bending of space-time... The galaxy seems to spin around the Earth, even though to the galaxy the Earth is spinning within it. Does that answer your question? Of course. Yeah, that's I'll... your reference frames, knackered, Nathan. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> you and your reference frames are ruined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Oh, wait. Ooh. Only apparent distances. Any I don't know, but, but it sure throws a wrench in Ar Arwen's baller argument of lockstep. Hold on, you need to uh, slow on, the, uh, on the answering of the questions. So he says, stars moving. I assume that's in reference to axial rotation. That would be the stars moving, though, wouldn't it? As opposed to us moving on an axis on a sphere Earth. Oh, look, a red Ferrari just drove past me, Nathan. That means we're on a ball. What, are you saying it's non-sequitur? Yeah. Of course, it has to correct for Coriolis deviation at the steering wheel. There's two what? rotors on the uh, Chinook helicopter, mate. It's, you can't distinguish whether you're on a sphere or not, on antipodal, just by looking at the sky. 
Well, well, no, Arwen just hit the nail on the head. You would, because that would be an assertion that they're drifting with Coriolis deflection, i.e. you're turning underneath the stars and seeing them rotate because you're turning underneath them. Well, if that's the case, then we're on a non-inertial spinning reference frame, and things that leave that non-inertial spinning reference frame would drift away precisely as they claim on a globe Earth for us to observe Coriolis deviation. Distance to sun is 186 blah 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 miles. <laughs> We're moving on, are we, Unitox Femi? He's heckling us with super chats. I love it. <laughs> move on, move on. <laughs> Distance to the sun. Well, doesn't the sun... Well, we, there's no distance to the sun. There's only apparent distances based on presuppositional vantage points. Sure, we've just done this one, Nathan. Like I say, we're being heckled with super chat, so I'm not complaining, my friend. <laughs> so, so the the Coriolis and the sun, when the sun goes down and lights the bottom of clouds, so when it's not attached to the Earth, uh, right? Remember that one. And all members, please, please stop heckling with super chats. You distract. No, no, the show. shush, Owen. I mean, I thought you were... sleeping warrior. No, no, no. He says I would me... never say something like that. I <laughs> know oh, you wouldn't. <laughs> You're. You're as into the cash as I am. Not that anybody doesn't need cash. Everybody requires paying in some form or another. So there we go. Uh, Unitox Femu says, give me the question. Well, any scientific evidence of uh, gravity there, Unitox Femu? Or anybody on the panel, more, moreover, I'm just joking. <clears throat> I don't know why what's anybody gravity? would such a thing. Uh, the mumbling from Sleeping Warrior and what's gravity from Arwen? Go ahead, Sleeping Warrior. What did you say? I don't know why anybody would think that there might be a, um, a, a thing called gravity. Where do we see anything that gives us that indication? Shouldn't that be relabeled what? any evidence for an effect? Hold on. There might not be any. Well, if you would know what it is, there might be. Hoping that you carry what on. Is it? And push it a little bit further. Might well, be what are we? If you would know what gravity was, then you might be able to find evidence for it. Oh, right. What is it, Arwen? We know it's uh, just... No, no, ah, next question. Tedious. Uh, this is getting tedious. There's an assertion there's a downward bias, Anthony. There you go, done. Ah, is that because all objects of mass are more dense than the medium that they're in? There are no objects of mat of solid matter that are less dense than the air, so one might inadvertently and incorrectly come to the conclusion that there might be a downwards acceleration bias because we see all objects of solidity more dense than the medium that they're in. That might be the misapprehension. Yeah, pretty concisely put, I suppose. Yeah, downward bias the is for the dense. Hold on a second, say, say again, CIA, whatever the rest of your name is. There's another, there's another miscomprehension. Like when you sit an object on the table and you remove the table, you didn't add a force per se. You just removed it, removed the thing that was resisting it. So, you know, there is no, there's not that force. There's no down, what? down force. Yes, there is. Relative density disequilibrium force of denser objects versus medium. And as long as it's That's surrounded nice by a less dense medium, like air, even if it can't move, it's still going to press in that direction because it's still not at equilibrium mean, with its surroundings. You mean it's going to have resistance or not? What? So if I take the resistance, it's going to move. If I put the resistor back there at the table underneath your ass, then you're not going to move. If I remove the table, I didn't add a force to your head. I just removed the thing that was was just in your ass. Let me just try the other way around, CIA for Arwin. So if you replace the medium, you introduce liquid, and some of the things floated on it, moved up in the room that they're in. Again, what force have you applied? You've just changed the medium that they're in. Was that a question to me? No, I'm just trying to reverse what he's saying. He's saying, well, if you right. if you don't remove it, it's like, well, what if you change the medium completely, introduce water, and then they go up? You know, if you say, well, if I remove the table, the thing will go down. But there's no force applied. You're just removing the thing that's resisting it, putting it into a f what's actually called fall arrest. That's what you're trying to describe. And likewise, well, it's arresting yeah. the fall, but it's also arresting a uh, medium like water, making all the stuff that's capable of floating moving upwards. If that was introduced, you know, it's the same principle. It's just medium specific. I'm just going to read out some of the super chats because they're coming in thick and fast. So, uh, Unitox Fremo says, I caused the mic to fall. 
<laughs> well, yeah, you do if you pick it up. Uh, we've also got James Richard who says, gravity fails to meet any, in quotes, of scientific methods, but you can think of it that it meets them all. <laughs> well, I suppose you could think of it that way. Shout out to Powell Broder, who's joined as a lion. Thank you very much for joining us, a Nathan Oakley 98 channel member. And also another Unitox Femi who's hit the uh, super chat hard and fast today. Thank you for all your support. And same goes to you, James Richard. Uh, gravity is a good word for proving everything. Or proving nothing at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Unitox Femi. James Richard, Pal Broder for the support. Move on with housekeeping. Just hang, hang on, hang on. Oh, go on. Go on, time. Okay, I was going to say that example was very good because if you imagine a, a room with a inflated ball sitting on the table and then you flood that room with water, as the water rises above the table, the ball is going to go up because of the medium. So that was a very good example. Just the opposite of CIA's example, but yeah. Again, though, it's, it's an example of... You're doing work. When you change the medium, work has been done to introduce a disequilibrium. And that's why the ball will move until it goes back into equilibrium. But the reason is you've introduced disequilibrium. Now, whether that was a rest caused by a shelf stopping the ball moving, then you change the medium, you've still done work by... Um, creating disequilibrium you've done the disequilibrium in reverse this time you've changed the medium as opposed to just um creating disequilibrium by uh, moving it out of equilibrium lifting the object up but you've still the net effect is to create a density disequilibrium that then has to play out in this yeah, case I, I, can, ball I, can still, I, I can still give the example the way around that cia did if i apply you say work let's use a hairdryer to a puddle in very quick in a very short period of time i can see a disequilibrium being created and then the liquid will disappear because it's gone upwards but work had to be done now likewise work by the sun heating it up would create that disequilibrium also but an upward vector in that example without anything unnatural occurring like flooding a room not that that might not occur naturally but i don't know why i said that <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, the point being work is being done, whether that's the work on the object or in this case, the work in the medium, it requires the creation of disequilibrium for us to see density disequilibrium play out. There is no density disequilibrium when things are in equilibrium or in a rest from it. It, it can't play you. Change has to occur first. Right. And it doesn't do it on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, another shout out to Unitox Femu. So sometimes nice to be Santa. I think he's referring to me pointing out that he's smashing the super chat hard and fast. Thank you very much indeed for being Santa, Unitox Femu. Really do appreciate your support. Right, we move on in housekeeping. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Uh, Dr. Becky can't formulate a valid hypothesis, unfortunately. Can't she? Or won't she? No, she can't. Oh, no, actually, she claims to be a physicist. Maybe she could, but most of the mothers can't. Well, not in her field, right? But doesn't mean that she can't in general. Oh, does she class herself as an astrophysicist? Does she? Who knows what Becky is? Anybody? Tenth? I'm going to say that Dr. Becky cannot formulate a valid hypothesis because she claims to be an astrophysicist. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I'll go double check and get back with you. Thank you. I was going to say, Tenth should know this. He knows the date of birth, how big a feet are. No, he doesn't. <laughs> He's not obsessed with it. He sent her one comment and then highlights the fact that she never responded, that the trolls defended her. That doesn't mean he knows her shoe size. <laughs> I'm just joking. Wow, well, I'm going to defend Tenth to the hilt when it comes to anything like this because she's female, therefore all sorts of implications could be drawn. Uh, actually, I do know phenomenon like shoes exist. <laughs> it's a phenomena phenomenon of tenth. shoes. Come on. <laughs> yeah, we'll <see>. maybe <laughs> we'll see. No, but they no can be phenomenal, though. Yeah, but any hypotheses? No, none. We've got plenty of phenomena. That's word. the point, right? All these in, in astrophysics, isn't it? 
we covered this in the pre-show, right? There's plenty of phenomenon to be to, uh, to be studied. What's causing this? What's causing that? Well, especially I've in got it. Go on, go on. I've got it. I'm Dr. Becky Smithhurst, an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford. Yeah, your I love making stands. videos about science with an unnatural level of enthusiasm. <laughs> I like I like to focus on how we know things, not just what we know, and especially the things we still don't know. If you ever wondered about something in space and couldn't find an answer online, you can ask me. Uh, I, I, oh, oh really? I see. You see how pertinent that is, given that's her blurb. You can ask me how you can have gas pressure without a container, then, right, Becky? How can you have gas <laughs> pressure without a container? Uh, gravity, isn't it? That was what uh, M. Scott Veach did in his Forbes article. Gravity. Oh, yeah, that thing that doesn't pull. Yeah. Well, I, I did just what her uh, about section on her channel just read. Uh, I asked her, and she still hasn't got back with an answer. Many people Ooh. have asked her. Maybe if you stopped obsession about her shoe size, you'd get somewhere. <laughs> This is where we've got to give George Moose props because he did get back to Craig and he did have a conversation with Craig. I think he's the only one that's ever had a conversation. Quick shout out to Unisox Femu. He says, Diamond rain on Saturn is answer. Uh, to what question, though? Maybe we'll never find out. And then he's heckling us to move on with the housekeeping, which I said I'd keep brief. <laughs> Any evidence of the Molten Iron Core? And that's all for me. Merry Christmas, Nathan, he says. Says that's all for me. Merry Christmas. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the super chats. I really do appreciate it. And welcome, Elijah. But yeah, I will read out your uh, super chat that's most pertinent because it hasn't been answered. Any evidence of a molten iron core? Thanks, Unitox Femi. Just squiggles on a graph that we call P waves and S waves, and that proves that we're, the, the core of Earth is solid. No, they don't. No, they got it wrong. They, they didn't predict correctly when digging down 12K. Nathan, the P waves and S waves. That's just repeating the same thing now, isn't it? But they're not possible on any other shape, Nathan. P waves and S waves, I'm telling you. Hold on. Now you've introduced a begging the question fallacy that you're going to assume the P waves and S waves are travelling through a spherical surface that you've assumed, even though I've pointed out that P waves and S waves are wrong when digging down 12K. So what, just introduced the fundy presupposition of a sphere on top of that? So I don't notice and you don't have to address that the P waves and S waves aren't consistently accurate in terms of their predictions? Nathan, I'm a physics teacher. You're just a grocery delivery boy. I yield. You win. Oh, <laughs> appeals to education is always the winner. Of course. Well, they can't even they can't even show us a physical Earth curve, and they want us to believe they have something four thousand miles below us. They know about, and that's Earth curve is on the surface and should be there one point two two miles at one foot observer height. So if that's not there, then I doubt uh, they know what's. Uh, in their presupposition that we live on a ball that has a core. Any evidence of the R value, Earth radius? Another presupposition. Assume it at all costs. R? Ah, oh, Sasha's on the panel, I should say, Unisox family. Thank you very much, as you're actually here to say thank you to for all the super chats. Nope, can't hear you. <laughs> Didn't hear you, I'm afraid. Yeah, 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 I'm here. Yeah, yeah. No, only I want to say to unmute me. Nothing. I have nothing to say more. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm saying yeah, it to you. Christmas. I'm saying to you, thank you very much for all the super chats. It's also kept the chat reasonably flowing because it's, ah, it's members only today. It's Christmas time. It's end of the year, you know. I'm watching you like for four years. Wow. I appreciate, appreciate your work and that's it. And I appreciate your support. Any evidence of the R value? Anybody at all? But you need to promise me one thing. You need to come in fucking commentary. No swearing! Coffee. You totally ruined that. <laughs> when Corona finish, yeah. <laughs> when Corona finish, come and visit you, did you say? Because we are, we are here, man. <laughs> in yeah, I, I, did you say Coventry? Yeah. You say did he say Coventry? I mean, yeah. Uh, uni yeah. talks. It'd take a few more super chats than that to get me to Coventry. <laughs> That's I was going to say the best thing about well, Coventry. I, I can come in, Lamik, so no problem. <laughs> we'll have to sort it out. We'll, uh, Martin's it's, been pestering me to do a, an arranged. Minutes. 
we will sort it out. Martin in, in 2020, obviously this didn't come to fruition, we wanted to do a meetup, maybe even replicate going to um, the cathedral we did the first meetup at. Um, but that's something that we'll get, hopefully we'll get arranged in 2021. So yeah, for, for sure, definitely. We will end up shaking hands, I'm in no doubt. And man, I'm making so delicious pizza that you, that you cannot imagine. You never eat that in England. I feel can, can I, ask, can I like pronounce pizza. your your chat name? Is it Unitox Femu? Because I, I look at that and go, it just goes like a sneeze. Yeah, yeah that means in creation, that means despite everything. Despite everything. Oh, cool right. name. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, it's difficult to pronounce in yeah for 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 English people. Yeah, and also it's difficult for me to speak English because that is third language. Your third language. Yeah, I lived in Italy throughout the years. I speak and Croatian, Italian, and English. What's your second language? Italian. 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 The Croatian, Italian. Yeah. The Croatian is the native language. Is that what it's actually called? Croatian. Yeah, yeah. Ser- Serbo Croatian because that was Yugoslavia. Yeah. I thought it was in Croatian. <laughs> Croatian. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm Yugoslavian. If you want to to know, but that that country not exist anymore. <laughs> Excellent stuff. No, no offense, Unitox said, Femu, but we we said, are going to continue with housekeeping. Everyone. Okay, yeah, 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 of course. Of course. <laughs> Thank hey, you again on, for the support. When he said that his name meant despite everything, I thought he meant the spiders everything when he first said it. I thought, I thought he said cool. the start of everything, in spite of everything. <laughs> Croatia, then Italian, then English, third language. <laughs> My God. Any evidence you can have gas pressure without a container? Uh, no. <clears throat> Despite everything the ballers say, no. Yes. Oh, here we go. Gradient. Oh, Darwin. Gradient. <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> Gradient. I don't know what it is, so next question. Sorry. Gravity, which Maybe. you don't know what it is, so next question. That's yes. not going to work here. What are you talking about? quoting Neil deGrasse Tyson about how he doesn't know what gravity is. We do from George Musa. It's not a force. So no, he's not holding gas here. And Einstein. Better off saying Einstein. Well, Musa I... quoting Einstein, gravity is not a force. Yeah. Yeah, but it's Shout still, it's still and space May, time. And maybe Musa is wrong. <laughs> well, no. He's quite explicit that, about that how right he is. He, yeah, he explicitly yeah. tells that you the, that like you can... questions of the Clover, you know, like a, when you make citation citation about some or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Musa, whatever. They said, and if they are wrong, <laughs> but, but you understand? He's, he's been explicit there. I was going to say he's he's been quite detailed in how you can think about it. <laughs> so after explicitly telling you it's not a force, he disclaims that you can think of it as a force. But how you can think? Oh, you'd like an example, Anthony? Can you detail emergent forces from fight the flat Earth, please? Yeah, he's citing um, Professor Eric Verlinder from the University of Amsterdam, who's looking at a new way to describe gravitation using entropy, which is kind of our argument, um, a, a, a variation on our arguments. Um, but Craig doesn't realise that at this point. He hasn't realised that it's it's supporting our position um, because he sees the word force as at the end of entropic force and he thinks that's enough. So, um, yeah, it's entropy or entropic forces or apparent forces or emergent forces are all stemming back to Dr. Eric Verlinder, who describes it in effect of entropy. That's the shortest way I can say it. Okay, but entropy would dictate that the gas we're breathing would fill the space if the sky was a vacuum. So that's definitely not working in their favour. <clears throat> yeah, but it can be true because the sky is a vacuum, so therefore the second law of thermodynamics must be wrong. Well, no, they say uh, the second law of thermodynamics does not apply to the Earth, meaning that it doesn't apply to their model because it violates the second law of thermodynamics, natural law, as in laws we observe in nature. I was having a good conversation with somebody, a ball earther on uh, Flat Earth 24-7 on Discord the other day, and um, I realised how triggered he got. You know, you call it, um, the sky is not a vacuum. Well, I said, I went outside for a walk in space today, and he said, you went to a walk in space, and I explained what I meant. Because on their model, obviously, it's an open system, so there's no barrier between the deep space and us, because we're in it. 
But he's like, no, no, there is a barrier. Oh, really? What is the barrier? He said, it's the atmosphere. I said, right, and where does the atmosphere stop and where does space begin? And he, he didn't give it a coherent answer. And I said, there is no barrier, is there? So in the end, he conceded that there was no barrier. And I said, right, so when I go outside into the air or the atmosphere, I could equally call that space because there's nothing separating us between the two. Yes, and, he had and, to, he had to concede. Uh, and do you know who also defines it that way? Who? NASA. Really? Yeah, space starts at, at sea level. Oh, brilliant. I'd love to see, Where's that? Oh, you'll have to present that, Nathan, at some point. I'll dig it out. Because if space starts at sea level, where does space start at sea level? That kind of fucks their whole our argument up, doesn't it? <laughs> well, other than at sea level, if space was a vacuum, if the sky was 10 to the minus 17 tor vacuum, then the gas we're breathing would fill the space and we would be at 10 to the minus 17 tor at sea level. Oh, dear. Any anyway, evidence? Doesn't the imagine? Go on, go on, John. Is that John? Yeah, I was going to say, doesn't the uh, imaginary containers run out to the Carmen line, or does it go to the moon now with imaginary containers? Depends which reference. I think it was 1996 or somewhere thereabouts. They introduced this idea of the atmosphere extending to the moon. It then got buried only to be dug out in about 2017. I'm going to say. Was it three or two years ago? Was it 2018 they started quoting this nonsense from 1996 about the gradient going all the way up to the moon with the moon spinning around us? So like a like a whirlwind flying through space, I suppose. <laughs> when you imagine the corkscrew image of the heliocentric model flying around the great attractor, you see it in this corkscrew motion, right? Well, if you've got the moon with an extended atmosphere like a sperm tail extending to the moon from earth and that's whizzing around us and we're whizzing around the sun you'd have literally like a hurricane motion of of atmosphere going around as you looked at it from a, th a third perspective you know if you could get out away from their ideas of this great attractor with us flying around the sun with the sun flying around it just absurd but there we go Hey, Nathan uh, if, when you're done with the housekeeping there's a message Bev posted in uh Master B. Message from me and Master B. Did you say? I yes. didn't catch the end of that. Say yes, that again, Yes, uh, Bev posted the message. It looks like it's coming from Ranty and Master B. Uh, I was going to go to Sleeping Warrior with his presentation because we have just finished housekeeping. I don't think I've missed anything out. Um, so can it wait till after? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I mean, is it on topic for this specific question? Is all I'm asking. If not, we we'll go to Anthony. Then no, we'll no, like it, it, it can wait. We have the time on the show. Perfect. Um, Anthony's going to present something now. So, um, what I'd ask of the Discord and G Plus panel, if you can just keep any questions that you've got till the end of the presentation, even if you don't necessarily agree with what's being presented, it doesn't matter. I don't care. I want to get to the end of it before anybody interrupts. So, if you can bear or uh, uh, give Sleeping Warrior indulgences in this regard while he's presenting. Uh, I do actually have you on screen now, Sleeping Warrior, so... You see my um, Good Times for All screen, yeah? No, I just see a black screen. Oh. Stop sharing. Let me retry that. <clears throat> Present now. Entire screen. Should be that one. Do you now see it? Nope. I see it. Really? Me too. Okay. What I'll do then in that case is I'll try something like pinning me and then unpinning me and pinning you. Let's just try if that works. There we go. Right. So um, this has come because someone sent me a link. I wouldn't normally have caught this because um, it, it happened over Christmas. Um, but someone sent me a link in a timestamp. So shout out to the people that send me uh, info. It helps uh, progress the conversation. Um, the presentation is for the purpose of anybody that might be on the fence with regards to whether or not there is a downwards acceleration force that appears to be like gravity or not. Um, if you're not sure, this is the way you need to come back to in future. So make a note of the time of this. It's like 30 minutes in, and obviously it's on this particular show. Okay, so it comes from Zach's channel. Um, Zach had a conversation with a few people the other day. It's entitled Talking Electricity with LC King Grabbing Energy Out of the Air on Good Times for All channel. Um, and it's only had 560 views now, but it was only streamed two days ago on Boxing Day. My comments underneath, you'll come to that in a minute. Um, so I'm not going to read it out now. 
I want to try and get it get through it as quick as I can. Um, so I don't have any beef with Zach personally um, or on topic as far as I'm aware. Um, he did bring us to the topic of diffraction and how things blend into the horizon. And um, that was one of the key things that we realized was happening with regards to the layer of dirty air at the horizon or ether band or whatever you want to call it. The effect we see at the horizon that distorts what we perceive is one of the key things that he brought to the topic and that's progressed the, st the story and credit where it's due and um, i don't have any issue with zach personally um, might not agree with everything he says um but nonetheless that's what he brought to it and that was a really big moment for us now <clears throat> i'm going to cite three video clips um from bob saying stuff and i've got them cir circled um in the in this bit here you can see where they are if you want to go back and listen to them from this hangout and it's three points deliberately to, to move the conversation forward. There's no personal attack. It's just to point out things that might not be actually true or things that are actually incorrect. Um, so I'm going to flick over to my sound feed so I can pick it up now, but I'm going to also uh, present on screen what he actually says and my response. So hopefully if I now play this, you guys should hear it. So and it's, there's a little bit longer, so you, you hear that I'm not cherry picking it. Uh, so let me patch this through. If you take a gas and you put it next to a chamber that is, is evacuated, right? You've created a vacuum chamber in it and you have a little window in between them and you open them. Is it true then that the gas will go in and fill the available space um, and go bouncing around all over the place? The answer to that is absolutely yes. There is no doubt about that, that that will happen. It does happen. Nobody is disputing that. However, what uh, you know what, what is being ignored here is that after a while what will happen is the gas collisions will eventually begin to slow right they will you know those collisions will become less violent as that energy is kind of you know is kind of depleted out of that initial energy transfer and the gas will begin to settle and start taking on a density gradient bottom first so in other words, what I'm saying is, is that the gas will settle on the bottom and it will provide its own gradient. So Bob emphasized the final bit, the bottom first bit. And my response that is to that is that, hey, Bob, gas collisions are elastic and do not lose momentum over time, as you wrongly asserted, from one hour, eight minutes onwards. Your incorrect assertion is therefore not the cause of any layering. So what else could be causing it? I know we can test it too. Now, there's, there's actually two causes to it, um, which I'm going to show you in a sec. Um, but density is one element to it, and the other element is the sun and the, the biogeochemical cycle, which we'll come to. Um, so he's wrong to say that the collisions between the container walls are uh, losing momentum because they're elastic. And I only learned that in the last fortnight or so, courtesy of Meekin. And I didn't realize the importance of it when he said it. But the elastic collisions mean that they do not lose momentum, contrary to what Bob is saying, and therefore that cannot be the cause of any any perceived gradient or, or pressure gradient or density gradient, whatever you want to describe it. I've got this background laid in such a way to create the perception that I'm trying to describe. Um, Bob's perception is that the the cause of this gradient in the, in the atmosphere is the loss of momentum. He doesn't realize, and, and he won't accept this when it's pointed out to him, but he has to accept it because the collisions are elastic and there is no net loss with, um, from the collisions between the walls of the container and the molecules themselves. So there is no momentum loss. That's the first point. Second point I want to go to now, if I go back to this, um, at one hour, 11 minutes and 12 seconds onwards, this is what Bob then says. Um, out with these challenges you know trying to explain to me about how there is no downward vector well i'm sorry sleeping warrior there is a downward vector it can be proven every way but sunday um, and you simply ignore all of it you know i see why the ballers have a problem with these guys because there is a downward vector so bob's insisting that there is a downwards vector right this perception is caused by the perception that everything drops to the ground well, that's because you can't pick up fluids, liquids, um, and and all sub all objects of mass are all more dense than the medium in air that we live in. There is no downwards to, uh, vector, Bob. From eleven one eleven twelve, you insist that there is a downwards vector, Bob. 
all solids are more dense than air. The least dense or the lightest solid that we have is said to be that pale blue stuff, aerogel, which is this stuff here. It is around six times more dense than air. Your perception is that all the solids are being downwards biased. No, they are more dense than its medium. And if we increase the density of the medium, guess what? That aerogel will become the egg and rise, contrary to your belief that there is some bias. The perceived bias is caused by the relative density of the two things in question. So the, the aerogel is more dense than the air that it sits in. And that's said to be the lightest known solid, man-made solid, but it makes my point. So the perception that there is a downward bias is because all objects of mass are greater or more dense than the medium that they're in. So that gives you the perception that there is a downward bias, but it's not. It's caused by the differences or the differential between the solids over liquids and gases, because all solids um, are more dense than gas, all of them. So that deals with the second point. Move to the next slide. So one hour, 16 minutes in, this is what he says. But, you know, otherwise, I'm not going to change my mind on this. It is obvious to me that there is an absolute down. It, there is an absolute down, you know, up and down are not relative directions. Uh, unless you're a ball earther and you subscribe to Einstein's relativity, up and down are absolutes. There's no way around it. And the reason there are absolutes is because there is a, a ongoing, small, minor, very weak, downward acceleration that is present. Now, as far as what causes that, that's wide open for debate. Now, is it true? Okay, so it is obvious to me that there is an, an absolute up and down. The key point here is it is obvious to me. Up and down, by definition, are relative directions. So to Bob, there is an up and down. That is true. But that doesn't make it universal. It doesn't make it objective. It doesn't make it an absolute it is obvious only to Bob, okay? Because Bob's left or right would be the opposite for me. So what Bob would call right, I would call left because I'm facing Bob, yeah? So it's obvious only to Bob that there is an absolute up and down. No, not absolute, it's relative to the human. So, oh, and by the way, when Bob compares um, up, down, relativity, relative directions to Einstein's relativity, that is a false equivalence because it is not relative to Einstein's theory of general relativity. Bob conflates these two things and they're completely and utterly wrong. So when Bob com um, compares relative directions to Einstein's relativity, it's a false equivalence because they're not connected. But he's, he's, he's making it sound like they are so that he can cause division between relative directions and Einstein's relativity and they're not the same thing. So correct him when you hear him say that, it's a false equivalence. Okay, so let's go back to his, uh, the slides. So all my comments that I've just read out are all in this uh, thing, which is hidden on Zach's channel. If you do want to read the message again, it's on screen for you. Um, there's the gradients that we're talking about in the atmosphere. It's a visualization of. Um, it's more pressure at the bottom. It's less pressure at the top. It's caused by the air depleting. And the question is, is it being pulled down the way Bob claims or believes or pushes? Or is there an another explanation for it? We know what the biogeochemical cycle is. We get taught it in, in primary school when we're about eight. But we forget about it as an adult because it's not something that we come across very often. If you want to know more about this, just look at the pictures when you type in biogeochemical cycle on Google, then click images, and it tells you pretty much everything that you need to know. The bit that it doesn't tell you is that it's a collection of cycles, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus, the oxygen, the hydrological cycle, the water cycle. There's about 10 or 12 of them. There's a lot of them that go on, and they're all caused by the sun. So the biogeochemical is a collective phrase to describe a whole variety of cycles, and they're all, they're all literally charged and powered by the sun. Okay. Now, the atmosphere that we live in, or the air that we breathe, we need to know two key words. We need to know isotro isotro isotropic, and we need to know homogeneous and know what these words mean. Is if, if the atmosphere is isotropic, it is, it is ununiform in all directions. If it is homogeneous, it is of the same kind. Now, we don't have a homogeneous atmosphere, but we do have an isotropic. Um, is isotropy is ununiformity in all directions. Well, there is no uniformity in the atmosphere. It's a dynamic system charged by the sun, excited by the sun, and created by all the gas pressure, all the gases are created at ground level. 
So the sun is exciting the air that we breathe, but it's also causing the creation of gases at ground level, be it water or land. All of the gases are created at ground level, charged and powered by the sun. The reason for the gradients, as this image shows, the gradient is, is the sky, obviously. It's caused by the, the creation of gases at ground level. We got taught it when we were six, seven years old. But because it gets so convoluted by science, no one remembers it. No one remembers it because gravity makes more sense. Logically, it does seem to make sense. But this is the reason why there's the gradients at the bottom. There's more pressure at the bottom because all the gases are created at ground level and they all rise through dispersal they all disperse into the atmosphere but when the sun disappears at night time a lot of them then come back down again because the temperature reduces and we have something called condens condensation or the condensing of gases they all fall back to the earth so that's the reason why there's a, a density gradient right that's why we have it getting more pressure at the bottom less pressure at the top and it's relative to the human right really the correct units are more dense and less dense because that's what it is which is takes me back to my test Back in May of 2019, I demonstrated that by manipulating the medium, I caused an acceleration. Now, by changing the density of the medium, it doesn't really matter how you argue over it. Bob said in his last thing that you can argue over the cause. In, in that last clip, um, clip that he said, let me flip back to it quick. He said, as far as what causes the downwards acceleration, that's wide open for debate. Well, we know that the biogeochemical cycle deals with one part of it. But when it comes to liquids and, and, and solids, this is the cause on the other side of it. So if you're talking about gases, because all, so all solids are more dense than gases, then we're talking about the gas laws and the biogeochemical cycle. If we're talking about fluids and liquids and solids and, and things that go on in, that we can touch because they're perceptible to touch, then we do know the cause. So it depends on what you're talking about, sky or land or tangible things that we can touch. But we do know the causes of them. Gravity is literally being used, or this downwards acceleration bias or perception or electrostatics or what, what, whatever phrase you want to call it, is literally trying to confuse people. The simplicity is, is demonstrable, it's repeatable. We can all do it on ourselves with no experience, no expensive tools, no different. No, it's just very simple to do. We can test it, we can show it, we can prove it. We know what causes this downwards bias, which in this test demonstrated that the egg went up. So we know what causes it, and it depends on the medium. So final slide. Bob calls this down because Bob is human. Using the correct verbiage that Bob refuses to accept, the correct direction is simply more dense. And unless there is a human there to call it down, down is relative only to a human. It is a false equivalence to compare down being relative to Einstein's general relativity. Right, I'm done, boys. Okay, I posted that link to that wiki last slide in the um, live chat. So check it out if you want to read that. But yeah, it, it describes it specifically as being relative to a human. I, your perception is based on you as opposed to a fish's perception or something else. You know, it's relative. So it's very specific in that. But yeah, thank you very much. Good presentation. If anyone wants to challenge it, no, have any comments, feel free to... Hold on, Anthony. If anyone wants to... And can you back off your mic a little bit? Um, because you keep causing plosives. <laughs> anyway, uh, anybody wants to challenge that, feel free. Now's your now's your chance. I want to know if he disagrees with Bob. <laughs> you having a laugh? Off with his head! Off with his head! Let's keep the nonsense to a minimum. <laughs> Does anybody actually disagree or want to challenge anything that Sleeping Warriors just presented? I do want Adam to comment on the elastic collisions because that's a. I didn't realise the significance of the elastic collisions until um, I heard Bob describing the the slowdown in momentum of the gas pressure that was causing a, a perceived gradient. Adam, yeah, um, I'd like to see something that would corroborate that. I mean, from from my understanding in the the little setup that that was described if you release those molecules um, then they'll be subject to gas behavior now the, the way in which we would describe the energy state of those molecules and their speed and the lights would be would be to use pv equals nrt um so the thing that would vary once you've just introduced those few molecules in there the thing that's going to vary their speed um 
everything else is fixed. The, the number of molecules is fixed. The, 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 the volume is fixed. So the only thing that's going to change the rate of those collisions is, is the temperature. Um, so you could slow the molecules down, but that would be as a result of a drop in temperature, uh, as defined by PV equals NRT. I don't understand where they would be running out because, as, as you say, an elastic collision means they just hit each other and carry on as they were. There's no loss of energy with the collision. That'll be something that we can ask Bob to demonstrate, though, right? Hold if on. Bob thinks that there is a oh, reduction on, in momentum, Sorry. then One we second. can show pressure, pressure loss yeah. as a function of time. Because the momentum is lost during the non-elastic collisions that Bob thinks must be there. Right, it's fundamentally incorrect. I think that was pretty much detailed by Adam. And yes, correct. The elastic collision detail has been part of the presentation in terms of the fake space we call a sky vacuum in basically every single presentation QE's done. Now, that's not to say that the significance, and I totally agree with Anthony, I'd heard it in every presentation QE had done, but it hadn't recognised the significance in terms of how you can then use it to your advantage when you're debating until Adam pointed it out a couple of weeks ago. And so, I don't know why it was specifically for both me and Sleepy Mario, but we both have, so kind of had a half Eureka moment going, well, that's actually a really useful angle. And in Anthony's case, he's like, well, I've never heard of elastic collisions. And I was like, yeah, you have. You've heard them in all these presentations. And he's like, oh, yeah, I have. <laughs> but it's just what the way Adam, I don't know what it was about Adam's phrasing. But anyway, I want to get to Paul, who was trying to get a word in there, which is why I've just interrupted with that long little rant. Go ahead, Paul. Well, the, the, I think, I mean, the way I understand it, just to kind of back up what um, Adam is saying, heat is the vibration of the particle. It's not the direction of the particle. It's just the vibrational. And what causes that is the when photons hit the particle, it heats up and it starts to vibrate. Of course, now, of course, everybody's screaming in the background. But it's the momentum and the direction that the elastic collisions occur. But the vibration is the movement of the particle just vibrating, causing the heat. Did everyone catch that? Adam, did you catch yeah, that? Yeah, as I said, and that vibration rate is in PV equals NRT. The simplest way is if you increase the temperature, it's vibrating faster. As Paul's described, you can introduce energy like with a photon and heat it up with, with sunlight. That, that's, that's the case. But I'd, I'd like to see this. I mean, I'm, it, it reminds me a little bit of what... what what Brian was saying, and there is certain gas behaviour when we put things under pressurised systems where you will. Brian was talking about some um, industrial uses where <clears throat> they were saying you must agitate a cylinder uh, beforehand, and that is, that is correct. You will get some ordering when you put a gas into a cylinder under high pressure. There is a density, relative density ordering that occurs, but that isn't that doesn't occur when it's just everything's just acting under gas behavior. The reason that occurs is when it's under very, very high pressure, then you get a phase transition. So not directly, but the, the gas molecules begin to act more, in fact, very similar to liquid because this, they've been compacted so close together, even though they are gas-like still, there's no way for them to behave truly like gas molecules. So they start to behave with more fluid, direct fluid dynamics. Uh, and there you will get some um, density set settling because they are behaving like fluids. Now, that is why you have to shake the canister, but you're shaking the canister to mix liquids not mixed gases and that's where i think there may be from my understanding of of aerosol technologies and, and the likes that's why you do that there it's when it's under very very high pressure uh, and it's because again it's not acting like a gas it's acting like a liquid that's why you get some kind of set like you could describe it as ordering of the gases but it's not ordering of gases it's ordering of liquids but exactly or, or, so I want to reiterate that. In other words, in a normal setting, that would be nature. That does not occur. Now, that's not to say that you can't force it into that setting. A good example would that be um, hillbilly blue balls forcing butane into a pipe. But that doesn't change what happens naturally in nature. 
Now, entropy increase will still absolutely, without question, occur. In other words, come back a week later, there's nothing left in the pipe. It's all dissipated because there's gaps between it. Now, as Adam's pointing out, you can get gas to behave in certain ways if you force them together so there's no gaps. But that isn't how gas behaves in nature. Now, if you go up to a very high altitude, the mixtures, they're basically the same. Now, that's in flux generally. We're in dynamic systems, so it's not to say that you'll measure it at the top of Everest and go, well, look, there's a very slight variation in the amount of nitrogen. Well, yeah, that's because it's in flux. It's always changing. Everywhere, always. But as a basic general rule, as an oversimplification, it's the same exact stuff. There's just less of it because there's hardly any of it being created. But because there's gaps between it all, it all just mixes up in pretty much the same way. It's an anisotropic, inhomogeneous mixture of gases. But when you go up high, it's not separating out into nitrogen and helium. That's not what's occurring. And, and just to kind of add to that just a little bit, I mean, when you get the vibrational rate of a mark, uh, particle, you're able, it's able to actually create bonds between other particles. So that's what creates things to condense, to create a liquid, to create a solid. But if the vibrational rate is high, it won't happen, or can't happen, or it'd be less likely to happen. And that might be attributable to all sorts of different things. It might be the cause establishes that uh, electrostatic forces causes that. Well, great. Let's establish it with science. Why does that happen? Why do we have phase changes? That's a phenomenon that we can study with science. So, wonderful. Some things are definitely within the remit of science. Now, if you want to establish the cause of those phase changes, more power to you. But... In the meantime, the overriding idea that we have a downward bias is shattered by things going up. And the idea that they're losing energy as they go up, notwithstanding that you do have PV equals, uh, PV equals NRT, and you can calculate how much you're going to slow down, if you want to call it that, based on temperature. But we still have elastic collisions. The amount of uh, force that they're going to apply to the container that they're in will change with the concentration because there's less particles pressing on the walls of the container. But their collisions are still elastic regardless of how low the concentration is, therefore the lower the pressure, higher up, where the gases aren't being created. Was that a succinct enough summary for this particular discussion? Anthony, Adam, Paul? I think, yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is the um, the aerogel point is that all solids that we know of, there might be some less dense than aerogel, but all solids that we know of are more dense than the medium. That's why there is the perception of a downward bias, but it's not. It's a perception only subject to the human. The actual reason why they are separating is by virtue of their density, and we know that because we can manipulate it to prove it. Because if I change the medium, the density of the medium of the air around the aerogel, the aerogel would become the egg. That's what would happen. I don't know whether you can get a gas that's six times more dense than air, uh, but if you could, that's what would happen because I demonstrated it. Quick shout out to James Richard, who's um, going back on the conversation about half an hour, but nevertheless, all good. Becky is is a pseudoscientist communicator. Sorry, I'll start that again. Becky is a pseudoscience communicator and up there with the best of them. Yeah, a reference to Mick West, who called himself a science communicator while he punted his mathematics and pseudoscience reifications of physical horizons blocking boats and buildings, now denied by fundies. Thank you very much indeed for the super chat, James Richard. And thank you, Anthony. Um, I was wondering if... Go on, Paul. Uh, uh, John, sorry. I was wondering if... Uh, I work in construction a lot, and asbestos is something we run into and when it becomes friable it'll hang in the air for years on end in, in a closed system is uh is that affected by bob's downward bias when any gas is violating this idea of a downward bias gas expands in all directions and the collisions between it and the container and itself are elastic so it's going up as much as it's going well, down and bouncing off and going back up again you know, it's going in all directions. So this idea of a downward bias is essentially violated by gas, which doesn't have a downward bias. Well, asbestos is a solid that hangs in the air. Yeah, fibres. Yeah, but what he's saying is, like dust, I suppose, when you 
shine the sun through your room, you'll see a load of dust particles suspended in the air and they're solids, right? That's what he's saying. He's saying that asbestos is light enough to be suspended in the air for a very long period of time. And maybe not, the not system we're in is, is dynamic enough to keep asbestos in the air for years. Maybe. But it's a solid he's saying isn't going down. It's being suspended. Can we have... suspend it, Nathan? Um, it's not being suspended. It's right. being kit loads, isn't it? It's, it's been subject to lots of collisions, which is why it doesn't go in a direction itself. Yeah, it's just subject to collisions but it's suspensions a, a funny one because suspension is more related to a fluid description that's just um, my poor okay my bad in terms of my vernacular the, the particles of air are hitting it and it's becoming part of that description when we describe elastic collisions well they also hit anything else that's in the air now often it won't be the case that that will make any difference to the path or vector of that particular piece of asbestos but in this instance there is small enough particles of asbestos that the elastic collisions with the gas that are in the air that we can't see keeps it suspended correct yeah 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 i was being anal, suspended i to use the word again i, I totally ruined that right. by using if, the word suspended if there's if the wind is not completely still if there's air flow pressure differential then that pressure differential will also carry the dust around and make it seem to float but it's basically just doesn't get a, a chance to settle down perfectly because if you put do the same setup in a perfectly isolated room then eventually it will all go down to the bottom no that's what he's saying no 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 he's saying quite the contrary he's saying even in a completely controlled circumstance you'd still have asbestos with the merely the elastic collisions of the gas keeping it in the air, i.e. not on the ground. I can't think of a word that's not suspended now. <laughs> you bugger. I wish I tested. Fnet, Fnet, wouldn't it be a net force? You've got net forces all around it, keeping it in that position. Yeah. Well, the, the, the force of the gases banging into it is what Adam's saying. I just used the word suspended incorrectly, which makes it sound like it's either your egg in, in a solution or, you know, it's it's just a wrong word. <laughs> That is the right word. It's, it's me, the, but there is a distinction between the, 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 as Brian would say, the structural mechanics that's going off in terms of that suspension within air and, and, and liquid. It's, it's, it's a very different, um, uh, there's this constant contact in, within, within a liquid as things uh, flow over what you're suspending, whereas within the gas, it's just constant, loads and loads. A good a good way of analogy is, is what Arwen said. It's not going in any, and I wouldn't necessarily vouch for it always staying up there, but it, within the dynamicness of, of the atmosphere, uh, the, the air we breathe it, you know, the, the, just, just the air, it's going to keep moving. And the way in which it moves and it floats, and with the way you see a feather flip is a good example to demonstrate the randomness of the collisions. So as this thing goes one way or the other, it's not going in any direction. Its direction is determined by the randomness of the collisions that hit it, hit that molecule, and that determines its direction if you say right and there's another factor too in the whole play of it play of forces in this case and that is if it is a object that is extremely small then like its surface area might be still relatively big so the smaller it becomes the surface area in relation to its uh, netto density will become bigger relatively the smaller it gets and so because of its surface it may still be get the full blow literally of any gas pressure differential of any pressure that happens and thus it will have a tendency to stay afloat longer in relation to more solid bigger objects that have that that have more density in relation to their net netto surface a quick couple of shout outs to retro bill he says really enjoying this conversation thanks guys and i really appreciate your super chat thank you very much indeed retro bill also desmond whom who says members only scared of public inquiry eh? no there's a link in the info box you can join and express your views verbally as opposed to spamming my chat with your rhetoric which often doesn't get responded to by the people on the show. But if you did want to join, there's an after show that is going to follow now. So if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. I've been Nathan Oakley and I'll see you all in the next video. <laughs>
both lower than the ones that are higher uh, higher up above it with less surface area. We got it. It made so much sense. We didn't we didn't question well, it. Because well, here, of the decrease, the relation, the vulnerability to outside forces in relation to its relative density disequilibrium force because of its combined density, the smaller it becomes, the more subjectable it will be to basically friction-like effects. And thus it will keep small particles afloat a lot longer than bigger particles. Well, here's something you can address. Let me help you address this issue with the slowing of the gas particles. That's why I said it when I said what I, the way I said it. Is it the vibrational rate of the particle is slowing, or is it the directional velocity that is slowing? Another quick shout out to Desmond Doom for hitting the super chat just as the show ended. Sorry. <laughs> Did anybody understand what I said? Yeah, I got I it. I got so, what you said. So when you talk about it's losing kinetic energy, how is it losing its electric or directional velocity, or is it losing the vibrational rate? The, the to a link, the vibrational rate, um, uh, then coupled with other molecular dynamics of it, they relate. Because when you're looking at um, ideal gas behavior, it's an admixture. Any individual gas will have its own value if you take it on its own so it's an idea so they have their own slight variance don't they even at the same temperature they'll go at slightly different speeds um, well that would only work that would only work inside a contained system though because yeah the vibrational rate is going to increase the the amount of rate of the velocity direction but once that free particle is left and it's not colliding with anything else it's, it's vibrational rate is not going to change its its direction or velocity. Well, that that that's what I'm saying. That'll be the gap that where my knowledge ends in terms of how vibrational rate and kinetic speed, uh, the actual speed of the molecule rate, and how those varies. But you're going into uh, it's, it's like bigger, look it up, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, here the thing about it. Here's here. Let me give you an analogy. A knuckleball. You know, you know what a knuckleball is, right? Yeah. Okay. In, in a way, that ball is vibrating through the air, so to speak. It's moving in random ways. But if you all of a sudden it's moving in a direction towards the towards the player, as soon as you remove the atmosphere, the the vibrational rate, the knuckleball stops, but the velocity and the direction does not stop. That's that's what I'm trying to analogize. That's what I'm trying to describe. You see that that sounds like you're applying Newtonian mechanics to a particle, which doesn't work to me. I, I know, but see, but see that that you're right because you have also the way they have to act in a quantum state at the same time. And that's another issue altogether. But I'm just saying is that if they're going to apply Newtonian principles, elastic collisions, you have to think of it the way I'm describing it. If not, it it falls apart. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at the links between that vibrational state. There, there, there is, there is a, a link, and I think, but I, I'd have to look to speak a little bit more on it in terms of it, but I'm pretty sure that's the two are linked in that, in that way. It's the vibrational thing that translates into kinetic speed, the kinetic energy speed. Well, the kinetic energy is the vibration rate but i'm talking about direction and velocity you're going to have to show that the vibrational rate will slow the direction and velocity that's what you're going to have to show yeah that's what i'm saying that's what i'd have to get a site to get go and look it up because off the top of my head that's a long time ago <laughs> that level of detail if you know what i mean that's the crap you try and forget as soon as you don't have to cite it and remember it anymore. <laughs> well, well I've, I've had to look at it because of the way the arguments have gone in Discord because of the ballers. So that's the reason I'm even thinking this way, even because I've had to go all the way back into research, like what causes the vibration of a particle with the photon interacting and knocking, you know, the electron into a different whatever shell you want to call it, and it's increasing the energetic state of the, of the particle, that kind of thing. So, Paul, are you saying basically the obvious, which is the momentum uh, and the direction are caused by the excitement and the vibration caused by the, say, the sun in this case, or heat. Uh, and when they hit each other, it's a random direction. Well, if, imagine, 
Well, when a photon hits the electron or it hits the, the gas particle, it energizes it and it starts to vibrate. You know, imagine it like it's vibrating energetically. Well, that's going to energetically connect with other particles, and that creates the the randomness that everything starts to move in, creating the so-called gas creates the so-called creates the gas pressure. Is that excitation of those right? Particles. That that GIF image that you had, where you increase the heat on uh, open the right. top, but right. But once that gas particle has not lost the heat, is well, it hasn't lost its energetics. I guess it hasn't lost its velocity and direction. It's just escapes and can't collide with anything else. It's gone. It well, as, long as, it's inside, as long as it it's inside, as long as it's inside that container that you showed, it's hitting off the walls. But once you opened up the top and had an avenue of escape, then it, it escaped. Right. But it's not colliding with anything else. Now it might lose the photon. It might lose some heat. Well, it has to. It probably does lose some heat. But this direction of velocity does not change if it's Newtonian physics that are in, in play. But so when, when you look at molecular theory, it uses Newtonian principles, which that's another another discussion for another day. I have a trick question for you guys in, in relation to what we talked about earlier about particles and all that. Feel free. It's a, it's a classic one. I'm trying to reformulate it. What what falls faster in regular air? A kilogram of feathers or a kilogram of rock? And probably yes, the, it is a trick question. Probably the rock because the surface area of the feathers, presumably in a bag, would be greater and create a greater resistance in the air. So I'd say the rock probably. Uh, you, yeah, you got it. But you're supposed to answer the question with how compact are the feathers? Because is if it is like airtight, wrapped perfectly still, then... Uh, well, then it might get pretty close, but if it's basically get pretty just close, but I'd still together, say yeah, it's all going to go very slow. <laughs> Even if you compacted <laughs> it together. Yes. Now, this is a weird one. Now, <laughs> because I was doing the acoustic treatment in this room, I've got some shelves and I filled them with duck feathers. Now, when I researched it, they obviously did some, literally some lab testing on how well feathers, chicken feathers in that example, uh, were good as sound absorption now they obviously formed it in various different ways one of them was compacting it together really tightly to see how that would work now <laughs> it just so happens that they had pictures of that and it still had rough edges like not like rock would have rough edges as in stuff that would still catch the air if it was falling i know this is getting really specific but i'd still say that rock would win every time because no matter what just pushing it through the air would would make some of the feathers fray off and cause more resistance i would say in the kilogram equal size of feathers versus rock so i'm going to say feathers will always hit second that would be my my argument for even if you compacted it together <laughs> there you go you would probably win on that every time anyhow because i think the average density of feathers even when perfectly compacted and plastic vacuum wrapped and all that is still going to be lower than rock. So the disequilibrium will always be higher for the rock than for the feathers, despite any friction situation. But yeah, it'd be, cool. it'd be cool if you got three different types. You got the feathers that were densely compact, you got the feathers that were loosely compact, and then you got the rock. Dropped all three out of a plane at the highest altitude you could get and see which one hit the ground first. And we all know which one's going to hit the ground first. Be interesting to see what the differential between the other two, though, with the feathers that are squashed and the feathers that are not so squashed, what the differential between them two would be. What about if you changed feathers uh, to I asbestos? Would... What would happen then? The fibers of would... asbestos. I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm being absurd. Let's oh. not do that. I don't think that's legal. <laughs> it's the next it's not legal? I'm going to get arrested for being descending this into absurdity. Well... No, but by releasing asbestos fibers in the out in the open just to, to do an experiment. That this isn't on the really is level. Nobody mentioned the word experiment. <laughs> or the glass. Well, or the glass. I was keeping the option open with the feathers and the rock. Like you could test this at home or outside. Just whoever said that, fiberglass is just as bad. The, the problem is, cause as, as a foreign body, it doesn't. You, you can't excrete it. So it just gets into, you, say, your lungs, and it'll just your lungs will just see it 
and form a layer over the top of it and it'll just stay there. Same in your skin, that's why it's itchy. Now, at least with your skin, as it sheds, it can actually eventually get it out, but in the meantime, it itches like hell. So that's, again, I only, I only know this from studying the acoustics of the room and the various materials that they use. And that's not something I wanted in the panels that I've got on my walls. I wanted very much to know that if one of them fell off the wall and smashed into pieces, that all the fibres that went in the air were very much natural fibres and therefore wouldn't be non-rejectable from me or my kids should the worst happen. Well, that's it might seem like, oh, well, who cares? Well, I care, <laughs> you know, because I don't want horrible man-made fibres stuck in my lungs that won't ever be rejected. That sounds like a very bad thing to me. So, no, fibreglass, no, it's the same principle as with... Um, uh, asbestos, which is why asbestos has been made illegal. Right, don't do it with fiberglass either. I hate that stuff. Well, it's exactly <sighs> the same. It's like the replacement for asbestos. That's all they've done. But it's the same problem with the man-made fibres. It's there's no difference. But you know, they just they get around regulations in those ways. It's just the world we live in. I'm not going to moan about it. That's just how life is, right? Yep. Something else to ban in 2025 or 2019, uh, 2029 or whenever. Well, suddenly all of these non-eco-friendly materials that everyone's got stuffing up their walls. Well, you're going to have to rip them all out. Well, that'll stimulate a lot of building work and so on and so forth, won't it? <laughs> you know. Well, don't get rid of fiberglass. Uh, we got boats in the water when fiberglass was first introduced to boating and they're still floating. Yeah, but they can't make that of anything else. And it's not just, it's fiberglass and resin. So it's not loose fibers. It's part of the structure. Right. Not the same as loose fiberglass, which when like blown up or broken open, can still float around and get in people's lungs. It's the same stuff, Arwen. If you, if you smash into the side of a boat, the same principle applies as the fibers break. The same principle. Uh, yeah. the, I was just saying, it's the same stuff. If they catch fire, the resin burns off, but the glass fibers are still there. Don't they melt? No. Well, not at the temperatures that the the resin burns off at. Hmm. Anyway, fascinating though this is. Started off with asbestos <laughs> being a joke if you compacted it and dropped it like feathers being compacted and compared in the air to rock being dropped. And there we are discussing the, <laughs> the supremacy in fire safety terms of man-made materials. Fascinating subject. This is. Welcome to fire. Well, we'll, we'll have to drop a rock. We'll have to drop a rock and a surfboard with resin and then just fiberglass without resin and see what it's first. No, let's not do that. <laughs> Or we could just put them all in a medium where they all get like very close to neutral buoyancy and change the medium and see which one moves first. That would be an equivalent way of dealing with it. Tony. Yo. I, I replicated your test and got exactly the same results as you. But what I did do also is looked how many elements there were lighter than air. And some searches said seven elements lighter than air. Some said 11. I'm not overly sure how many, but there are elements lighter than air. Um, yeah. The only reason we don't see them going upwards is because they're transparent. Well, I said solids, though. I didn't say elements. You replaced my word solid with elements. No, no, but he's it, it, agreeing with you. It's different on, elements. It's not Hold an on. element. He's not disagreeing with you. He's just expanding on your point. He's not in any way disagreeing with you. Correct, Brian? Yeah, exactly that. Um, but Bob goes on about everything goes down, goes boom, boom. But there are at least seven, if not 11 more elements that leave swamps, the earth, everywhere else that travel upwards every day of the week that we just don't visualize because they're transparent. Yeah, yeah, because you can check that out by looking at the density maps. Look at the density gradient and um, tables that tell you the density of all the objects or all the things. And there's a load of them that's more dense than air. Uh, sorry, less dense than air. Uh, don't be wow. confused. Hold update. on, hold on. I just want two corrections. One, don't be confused. Because we're in a dynamic system, the gases we experience are still anisotropic and inhomogeneous. So it's not the case that because those gases which cycle dynamically it doesn't mean we've got a layer of them. That that doesn't occur either. One more correction. Bob Nodell does not say gas go down, go boom, boom. That's Thunderfoot Clown. Just just don't attribute 
that nonsense of gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank. That's Thunderfoot Clown, not Bob. Right, Bob has a downward bias. And I have, if I may for a second, I, I, I used to say downward bias is for the dense. I got an update. Downward bias is not just for the dense, it's also for the opaque. Eh? Um, Bob like, attacks you on that gas pressure, go down, go boom, boom. He doesn't like the verbiage, so he ridicules it rather than addresses it. Good, because it's not our quote. It's what Thunderfoot said when he poured bouncy balls into a fish tank and went, boom! That's literally what he said. Notice that my response to Bob wasn't personal. It was on topic at all times. But yeah, maybe that's something that needs clearing up if it was assumed that that's being attributed to Bob and it was just by Brian and I corrected him. It's not. That's gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank, as asserted by Thunderfoot Clown. Now, the fact that we have people on the flat earth side that assert there's a downward bias, now that's a very similar argument, if not the same argument, as gas go down, go boom, boom, which is made by Thunderfoot Clown when asserting gravity. Now, coincidentally, strangely enough, they also call it gravity, which is a bit weird, but there we go, that's nothing I can explain. It's not my argument. On either side, I don't say gas go down, go boom, boom, it doesn't. Right, because they're two different mistakes. One mistake is uh, attributing an ability to gas, which is unproven, it doesn't happen. And the other is the reification of an effect, which is not present, not provable scientifically, a force field that cannot be measured. And it's supposedly insignificant. So it's very different types of mistakes. By me. Right? Again, Brian? Mistakes by me, was he saying? No. You can juxtapose the two. I'm just saying that don't attribute this, the actual statement to Bob because he didn't say, and there you go, boom, like Thunderfoot did when showing that gas can go down. Here's bouncy balls poured into a fish tank. So the boom, boom originally started with go down, go boom, boom, which was what... Uh, uh, Quantum Eraser would say, when describing how they describe things going down always on the globe side. But then literally Thunderfoot Clown poured bouncy balls into a fish tank and boom, end quote. <laughs> Flat Earth destroyed or whatever he said next. But my point is that gas go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank is very specifically Thunderfoot asserting gravity when showing how gas behavior is because they need gas to go down, go boom, boom. Now, in the case of flat earthers who assert this, they just seem to, at least wits it, and from what I gleam of the people telling me, ignore the fact that this bias has no bias with gas. The thing that's defeating it. So I don't know if it's whistling past the graveyard or what, because in some instances, when Rumpus came in and started to attribute the reality of asserting that things have a downward bias to wits it with gas... He then declared to Rumpus, no, I don't believe that. I understand that gas has entropy and it's expanding in all directions. It's like, so you do understand this, then it is definitely cognitive dissonance to assert a bias. But that's what cognitive dissonance is all about. Hence, uh, on a Friday show, I told the detractors, the people who are very negative towards Nathan and Witsit, that there's no need. You know, this is very, very strong programming when it comes to gravity. And what do you know? We've got a similar argument with a similar title about gravity with downward vectors that are violated by gas, leaving the people arguing it in a state of cognitive dissonance. Not shills, not controlled opposition, just people. And it kind of gets infuriating oh, yeah. when we are starting this discussion, going good with discussing it, for it to descend into the people on the sidelines going, look, they're shills, Nathan Thompson said, rah, 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 and wants to discuss it, wants an argument about it. It's like, yeah, so do we. Does that make us shills? No, we're just on the winning side of the argument. Does that make him a shill equally? No. So, you know, just lay off the people who are willing to come and actually discuss it in the ring of fire, I might add. You know, kudos to Witsit. He knows what he's going to get if he comes here, or I assume he does, if he, unless he's stupid. I don't think he's that stupid. You know, to come in and not realise that if you've got a fundy belief, it's going to get attacked with as much vitriol as anything else that's a fundy belief. But he'd still stepped in the ring, right? Is he discussing it? That needs commending in the same way as Bob needs commending because he's discussing it too. And he's allowing us to critique it going back and forth. Now, there might be some minor personal attacks that are still there. And inadvertently, Anthony may not realise by saying, oh, well, I'm not putting any personal attacks in there. It's like, mm, there's the lingering personal attack, though, coming to the surface. 
Now, I'm not going to highlight it too much before Anthony pounces on that. I'm just saying things are getting discussed. It's all good. Now, Witsit will get my admiration. He's got my admiration on board, Busters, and that absolutely still stands. You know, he annihilated Jam Pender to the point where we spent an entire show praising him for it. Well, as much as I say I lost a bit of respect for him, that was in the moment. Take it back. You know, Witsit's still a good guy. So is Nathan Thompson. The fact that they're willing to discuss it with somebody who's as abrasive in some instances as myself, you need a bit of praise, for God's sake. Don't just call him out of shills. Talk about kicking a man when he's down. Uh, you're a shill too, Nathan, because you're defending them. And obviously they made a mistake. And once you make a mistake ever, you're henceforth known as a shill. Defending them? I'd stand side by side with them. So, yeah, I will defend them. That's He's exactly kidding. what a shill would say. <laughs> Said the shill, who would definitely say that if he was a shill. <laughs> Whatever. You are a bit rough on with it, though. Yeah, as he deserved. Actually, I don't think he was too rough on Witsit. I think that Witsit got what he deserved because he basically pushes nonsense in that respect. Right. Hey, Good morning okay? or afternoon, Quantum Eraser. Hey, Brian. And hey, Brian. I, I, think, uh, I think it was just a, a point of... Um, uh, the pressure had to, had to blow, Nathan. Uh, you can't keep on listening to the same argument that's not being backed up, especially from people on our side, and not eventually get stressed out by it. It's very simple. Support the claim. Or concede you can't. It's that simple. And they are not conceding. You know, that's, or carry on. That's the problem. Carry on pushing it to newbies that might be influenced by your perception instead. That's an alternative too. Well, that's a problem, exactly. You can't be doing yeah. that. That's the point that's, of, that's of what we do. Yeah, yeah, that's just in the interest of balance, Brian, they can do whatever the hell they like. And as much as it being frustrating to you, I actually am not in the slightest bit frustrated by this because I don't subject myself to it on the whole. And when it comes to me, I'll deal with it in the moment. But this absolutely does not stress me out. And it shouldn't stress you out either. If it does, detach yourself from it immediately, you know, because it's not good for you. Well, it's not something that, like, I mean, it doesn't stress me out outside of it. But when I keep hearing it, it's like, it's, it's, look, if I, if I walk into a housing estate in England and I start making a lot of big claims and then I don't support them, do I lose my credibility? Yes. Just if I go into a military situation, make a lot of big claims and I don't support them, I lose my credibility. Go into a business meeting and make a lot of big claims and don't support them. Support them, I lose my credibility. Why should this be any different? It isn't. Not attacking you, Nathan. Uh, well, just it saying. isn't. When they came, if you want to say they, I'm going to bundle wits it, Nathan, and call it they. Sorry, guys, just the way it is in this combo. They have come here, presented it to us, or me in this instance, you were here, and it got taken to pieces, the same as anybody else who comes here. But beyond us dealing with it in, let's call this our bar, right? Well, then who cares? If they want to deal with it in their way, in their circles, you know, it's their meeting to lose the respect of their clients around their table. Now, if you happen to be in, in the auditorium above looking down on it, going, you know, I want to throw tomatoes at this meeting because the investors might invest. It's like, well, just, just leave the auditorium. You don't have to look down on it. You know, just don't look. Yeah. And, and also, I don't think that... Fair point. I think there's a difference between getting something wrong and losing credibility because we all make mistakes. And I think that the way, the way you deal with the... You know, like, if you get something wrong... I mean, I've made stuff... I've got stuff wrong in the past. Wow, um, lots of stuff. It, speak for yourself, though. <laughs> but, um, I think the key point is that if you deal with it properly and say, do you know what, maybe I did get that wrong. I mean, I did the wrong folk court video on a Friday night one time and it was a bit late. I was drunk, but if you realize that you've made a mistake and move on from it and accept that you made a mistake, you don't lose credibility there. Where you do lose the credibility is where you get told that you're wrong and then continue pushing that bullshit anyway. So, QE, we had an interesting conversation earlier on the show. I don't know if you're watching, probably not. Probably tucked up nicely in bed after lots of Christmas dinner. But um, the elastic collision... First day dinner. Say again? Birthday dinner. Birthday dinner as well, yes, indeed. Happy birthday to you for a few days ago. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, 21 again, eh? 
yeah, indeed. Forever <laughs> young. Go ahead, Nathan, before we get rumpus again. I've completely forgotten what I was going to talk about now. What, what... <laughs> oh, you had a conversation earlier? Oh, we had a conversation earlier, and that hasn't really helped me remember, but if I waffle a little bit for a while, I might be able to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Presentation, Bob Nodell. Oh, I can't remember. Plastic oh, no, it was about elastic plastic. collisions. I have remembered. So uh, Anthony was pointing out that the importance of elastic collisions um, came to him a couple of weeks ago when Adam discussed the subject. And he was like, I didn't know anything about this prior to then. And I was like, yeah, you did. Every single presentation ever about how you can have gas pressure without a container has had the detailed explanation of elastic collisions. And I even referenced, so that Anthony remembered it, that definitely was there, the three different states where you've got the animated GIFs of solid, liquid, and gas. And that's when you talk about elastic collisions and have them on, I'm going to say, at least half a dozen occasions. It's probably much, much, much more I don't think I went into. I probably just brushed over them. Yeah, now the phone starts to go off. Punk. But um, I, think, I don't think I got into it specifically uh, a whole bunch of times. I brushed over it indirectly, but it, it has been gone over many times. Yes. But the uh, the point that I want to make there is that sometimes you can be told stuff five, ten times before you realize that it's important. And I, I, I can admit that I didn't realize the importance of it until it came, became apparent very recently. And I was like, oh, shit, that's why that becomes. And then, uh, then it, it went in. But we all, we're all on our journey, right? And bits go in at different times, at different rates for everybody. And now I get it. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes and people on that journey are in chat conversating with everyone else and not paying attention to the presentation. Yeah, I was yeah, one of them. Yeah, that was names me. Or yeah, that was me. <laughs> well, no, no, no. no don't, you. Oh, hold on. Just because uh, when Anthony was watching your presentations in recent years, I was that guy when you were doing them on Cathex's channel four or five years ago. I was in chat talking shit. You know, I was that exact same guy. And then when you came to me with all of the things that I'd definitely already watched and thought, wow, that was cool for about 10 seconds before telling someone they were a fundy in chat or whatever, you know, those things you went through with me and just to back up what anthony's just said i even specifically said this to you when we were going through one to one yeah now tell me nine more times now tell me eight more times yeah. because although yeah i could parrot back the concept that you just told me probably verbatim after the second time it's not that it's the understanding of the significance is the reason why i was like no tell me nine more times <laughs> And yeah, I know it's irritating, but yeah. I still need it seven more times for me. And by the time you've had it the 10th time, you go, ah, oh, right, that's really important. I'm glad the black swan comes up because <laughs> I explained this by example to Anthony on a call this morning uh, with the black swan. So you and I were discussing the black swan in 2019 prior to its release to the public. And you'd put it to me in various different ways. And it was discussed right at length. But then when you finally put it into Modus Tolens and formatted it in the way that's now been released to the public with the image itself, you presented that to me. And I was like, do you know how important this is? It's like, you're the one who's been formulated for the last bloody two weeks or whatever, you know. <laughs> but suddenly the significance dawned on me, even though we'd been discussing it for a very long time, because it had been trickled in. You know, the, 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 if I'm correct, initially, I even said I didn't like it. When you phrased it off the back of Ben's presentation, I'm like, I really don't like this because all I could focus on was the idea of pumping up an earth to the size that Ben had exampled. And you're like, no, you're just not mm -hmm. getting it. The horizon can't be beyond that. And I'm like, yeah, but that's how it works in the example. And it was only when you went, well, if the earth's a sphere with this radius, then every distance to horizon, and this is the bit that sticks in my mind, can be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and feet. So when you hear that and you go, <gasps> It can't be beyond that. <laughs> it's beyond the physical limits. That was the point that I'm like, do you see the significance? <laughs> it's like, of course you do. You're the one who developed the bloody argument. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, on a couple notes, this is a serious, this is a serious level of white knighting for Anthony. I hope you appreciate that, Anthony, because th this is next level white knighting. Number two, it's not just understanding the significance. It's understanding the argument, the details underneath that support it, and then its significance. That's what I'd like to say. No, I can give a perfect Good example point. of that. So a couple of weeks after the Black Swan comes out, I understand the significance, but I don't understand the importance of the argument behind it. For example, 
I present QE with a picture of a non-refracted crane image with the horizon, probably in excess of the original black swan. And go, can't we just present this image? Because if we present this image, they won't go on about refraction. And with a wry smile, not that I could see him, <laughs> QE says, I want them to say refraction. Because that is the death nail of the argument. Now, that demonstrates that I didn't really understand the... I understood the premise of the argument, but I didn't understand the mechanics of the argument. And when it was pointed out to me with a wry smile, no, no, <laughs> I want them to say refraction. Well, why would you want them to say refraction? Well, because there's the paradox. You know, there's yeah. the death of their needing it. Al Biruni's measuring a physical horizon. They're claiming boats and buildings are blocked by its physicality. As soon as it's refracted, it's not physical anymore. Yeah. Where was the white knight in, John? I missed it. Uh, Nathan just spent the last five minutes white knighting for you. Oh. You missed it. I was on about yours. I saw it with Nathan. You're probably in chat, right? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to you. <laughs> Too funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep, 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 what? So no anybody comment. Else get, anybody else get any snow overnight? We got loads of snow. We got loads of snow, huh? Mm. We, we actually had a white Christmas where I'm at. We had a white what? It's always white where I'm at. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often here. We got like three inches where I'm at. And it's lasted yeah. till twenty seven. Always no, white where you're at. Wait, what, what are you, Coke dealer? Yeah, why is Ugh. your mind thinking that? I live upstate New York. <laughs> Before this conversation descends, so on Christmas Eve, snowflakes fell. So I went outside to put the bins out, and there's a few people mustering around. I was like, "Hey, hey, hey! Look, snowing!" And they're like, "Yep." So although we wouldn't class that as a white Christmas, there's a standard. The Met Office has to have a certain amount. Of snowfall on the top of it for england to declare a white christmas but we definitely didn't have that but i had snowflakes on christmas eve which i was very pleased about oh uh, you're lucky we didn't get we didn't get much here but that's a, that's cool yeah what other weather phenomena you want to talk about Thirty minutes into the hangout john um is the presentation i want you to just do, give me some feedback on and see what you think okay. obviously it's, it's been and gone now but it's it's a good presentation because bob some of bob's things were just like Fucking idiot. I didn't Bob address who? him personally. Yeah. I didn't address him personally. I, I just addressed his points. But um, I pulled them apart. And what points were those? Uh, well, he said, I'll read you what he said. He said, after a while, he's talking about the elastic. He thinks that the collisions between the molecules are non-elastic and that they lose momentum. Um, he says, after a while, what <laughs> would happen is the gas collisions will eventually begin to slow, become less violent as the energy is depleted out of that initial energy transfer and the gas will begin to settle before taking on a density gradient bottom first. So he was emphasizing the density gradient caused by the loss of momentum from the non-elastic collisions that you can see there. <laughs> <laughs> Then he said there was a downward vector, and it can be proven there is a downward vector. I pulled that apart with using aerogel and showing how aerogel is six times more dense than the medium of air, and it's the lightest known substance according to science. So all Very objects with science, according to technology, maybe then. By so science is a survey, you know. No, <laughs> shut up. I'll give him a break. A give him a break. Give him a break. Anyway, I was, sure I was using aerogel to show that the lightest known solid that we have is aerogel, and that's six times more dense than the air. So that's where the perception comes from, and he calls it and he calls it downward. So obviously, I went into relative directions, and then the last thing he said was, um, "It is obvious to me that there is an absolute up and down. They are not relative directions unless you are a Jeez. ball earther and subscribe to Einstein's relativity. Up and down are absolute. Oh my God." No, <laughs> open down yeah. at absolutes. There's no stop. way around it. Because... Stop. stop, please stop. I don't, I don't want to hear anymore. It's worth going back and listening to because he just gets destroyed. I also have him on screen as well, just to, even though it's not personal, just to make it personal, but without having to dig. So I guess I know where the elastic 
subject came from last the collisions yeah it came from well it crystallized from Meekin. no it's incoherent dielectric magnetism where where gases fall down to the ground and shit right go down go, go boom, down boom, go boom boom, boom go splash splash Oh yeah, that's what that's what he was focusing on. He hates that vernacular, that verbiage. He hates it. It's what? Probably because he didn't walk with it himself. Sorry about that. Back. Are we still on gases? Yeah, just talking about how Bob hates the verbiage of gas pressure, good angle, boom boom. He hates it probably because he hadn't thought of it himself. This isn't personal. Not because it's and a bad analogy. This isn't personal, and Anthony's not divining his thoughts. <laughs> It's not personal, but I'll put a big picture of him on screen and make it personal. <laughs> I don't know why we're tiptoeing around this issue. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to tiptoe around it anymore. Uh, my mission when I came out here was very simple. Expose pretender clowns. It was, it, it had no bias, no pun intended. Uh, it was just to expose pretender clowns. I am not I hear, I see a red sash. I pummeled a man that's wearing it. Why so look out. Like a bull. I totally agree. So, so you guys better stay in your fucking echo chambers, no okay? Swearing. Because I've just about fucking had it. That's no right. I'm just, I'm just about to the point where there's no fucking talking to me. Okay? I, I'm already there, so... On. Stop fucking swearing. Uh, stop swearing. Sorry about that. Stop. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you beep those out? <laughs> no. That's no then we wouldn't be able to hear the rest of you talking because it'd be continuous beeps. It just means I'm going to disclaim <laughs> that now. Yeah, so, sorry about that. I got a little hyped up there. I'm just, upon, I'm just frustrated. Okay. Upon uploading, I've just got to tell YouTube that there's swearing in it. That's all. And, you know, it wasn't <laughs> yeah. like... It wasn't like yeah, unit on spam that ruin that. Well, well, right, no yes, that little, it, it's given it's given me you know what it does to me because I review them, right? I this is just you know, back off of stuff, but it's real short. So you know where the spot where it says review and there's just light swearing and stuff. Some bitches said that I, I didn't uh, assess those correctly, like the last ten. There's <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, but you're supposed to. Because you want to be in good standing. Well, I want to be in good standing with YouTube, and I tend to get it right. And I get little notes from YouTube that says, "Well done, Nathan. You've correctly identified that people can't adhere to the rule, including you, and you declare that when you upload it." So I get little notes with a little balloon that say, "Well done. You've done well." <laughs> uh I get I get all the friggin' dead buzzards, right? Not the balloons. They send a dead buzzer and said, you didn't assess this right. We ain't trusting you. We... Fair enough. No, I'm very careful. Yeah. I... Go on. Sorry yeah, about that. that. I'll try to. I'll try to. I, I know better than that. I just got a little frustrated. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm getting lectured about it too. So I'm just as bad. I, you know, and Tenth Man's quick to tell me. <laughs> so. I have a oh, we just like to say that. that uh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, Brian, no, I, I'm just saying that my point stands. I, I'm not playing any more games. I, I'm just not going to do it. Topic. This is completely off topic, but let me it's say It's not off it. topic. It's right on topic. No, this is, shut up, shut up. You know that Tiffany Dover death that's not a death that might be a death? Oh, she appears God. on um, Ancestry as a death. Oh, it's like, how God. do you end up on Ancestry if you haven't died? Do I have to listen to this conspiracy hard crap? Really? You're going to poison the I'm end just of my telling show with this anyone that's interested. Oh, God. You told me to shut up to present that. Yeah, it was in the forefront of my mind. It was the most important thing in the whole entire world. <laughs> like, oh, what is my mind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just had to get it out, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like a sneeze. It just has to come out there and then. Are you intentionally diverting away from the topic? No, 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 no. Sorry, carry on. Uh, I'd like uh, to say that Brian, go ahead. Please. Be a bunch more square square word. Oh, oh, please, please, Brian, save us. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, a big problem on their side, and this is on topic, not personal attacks. A big problem on their side seems to be the understanding of why a helium balloon goes down in a vacuum chamber. 
There's two there's no reasons why that. Yeah, that's that's the exact the number one reason. There's no number one. There's no medium. The ga, the, the uh, helium has no reason to try and fight against any other gases, as there is no other gases. And the helium is contained inside a balloon, and the material of the balloon is more dense than the helium. The only reason it goes up when it's in air is because it has all those other gases uh, more dense and higher pressure around it, so it goes up. No, no, hold on, Brian, hold, hold on, hold on. Electrostatics, Brian. Do you, do you want a much more consistent or quick way to deal with that, right? So our argument is gas expands in all directions to fill the availability of volume uh, it has to fill. I know, right, the balloon and it'll fill, fill the chamber. Exactly. So what's happening in the That's balloon? Get there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Fair enough. My bad. Go on, you say it, don't Nathan. You say it. You, you well, have, well, you, well, exactly. You the, the balloon itself just becomes the container. So, okay, inside the balloon, all of the helium is expanded inside that container equally in all directions. Now, were the pressure on the outside of the balloon inside the vacuum chamber to be depleted to the point where there's not enough pressure for the tensile strength of the balloon to contain the gas, which is expanding in all directions inside the containment of the balloon, yeah, there's not a pool at the bottom of the balloon. Otherwise, it would be fatter at the bottom and thinner at the top. Now, that doesn't happen. But upon it breaching that container the balloon it will then do exactly the same thing in the vacuum chamber which is fill it equally in all directions so the balloons filled equally in directions it's given the containment required to demonstrate that the gas is going in all directions but they want to take the container within the container and say look my container in this container goes down well so what the gas inside it which is our example has expanded into its containment the balloon equally in all directions Uh, there is a video, though, where the balloon doesn't burst. No, that's why the balloon has its shape. So, uh, uh, okay, so there's a, an example where not enough gas is evacuated or the tensile strength is high enough to contain all of the gas. Well, it's all contained within a container. That's called a balloon. Regardless of what's on the exterior of the balloon, inside that container, the gas has filled it equally in all directions. So the gas behaviour is still violating the downward vector within the containment of the balloon. So is then, your container solid? Just wondering. Forget about the container. The gas inside the balloon is still expanded into the balloon equally in all directions. No downward bias. I know, but the solid is going down. But it's solid. Okay. Right. Genuine question. Meekin, are you there? Yeah. John? Yeah. If, if does there come a, a saturation point where if you keep pouring more and more gas into a container, there comes a point where it does start to not pool at the bottom, but does it create a pool at the bottom in the medium, or is it always homogeneous when it's one gas in one container? It, no, no, no. The pooling at the bottom is a pooling of liquid, so the gas pressure inside the container has become so much that some molecules are forced together so much, yeah? Now, the gas pressure above will sit above that pool in, in equilibrium based on the pressure and the mo molecules, so that that will sit. But you'll get any pooling that you get will only occur in a different phase when it's in its liquid phase, yeah? It, as soon as it translates back to being a gas, then it translates back to being a gas and behaves like a gas again, which is freely moving in all directions. Even though that space is limited, it's still freely moving. It's only when it's compressed so much that it's starting to behave like a liquid where the molecules are just sliding over each other instead of hitting each other, that it will pull. Because at that point, you've got a liquid, well, it's subject to relative density disequilibrium, so it's going to go to the bottom of the container. LPG. As it's falling in its liquid state, any bits that transition, any latent heat that comes off from that liquid, that gas molecule won't continue to fall. It will just go off in the direction that it, it is, its point of transition was. Why are people struggling with this? I don't get it. They were indoctrinated to believe that there's a downward bias in the form of a gravitational attraction, then bending of space-time both called gravity now there's a new kid on the block flat earth gravity 
Well, the fact that the indoctrination runs deep is, as I said on the live show, or maybe in the after show, I forget which, not something that's, like, uh, indictable. Is that the right word? Forgivable, right? Just discuss it, point out how it's nonsense, explain that gas violates that, regardless of if you put the container in a container or not. Gas will expand to fill the volume, regardless of if it's a balloon that's the volume it's filling, or if it breaches the balloon's containment, not strong enough, then it'll just be the chamber that it's in. And what do you know, if it was the case that that was a really thin plexiglass chamber and the gas pressure happened to be strong enough to evacuate through that because it caused a crack, then it would fill whatever containment it was in after that, and so on and so forth. It'll just fill whatever volume it's got to fill. That's what gas does, regardless if the container's a balloon, a vacuum chamber. Now, in our atmosphere, they're never close enough together to gradiate. It's inhomogeneous, or homogeneous, as some people say it, means that it's, like, in harmony. Right? That doesn't happen. It's all mixed up. Because there's gaps between it. That's why. It's just that simple. And get all of the gases, regardless of how dense they are, when you collapse them down or push them close together, they're all doing the same thing. Expanding out in all directions at high velocity. That's all they're doing. On the Zachary Zabala show with Bob on it there in the past couple of days, <clears throat> Bob Nodell admits that this happens. That if you bust a balloon, that it would fill the available volume. Now, he says it in kind of a tongue-in-cheek, kind of a sarcastic way. Um, more speaking about how it's said on the show here. Um, you know, so he didn't give it respect. Like, he didn't give it respect. It was more of a half an attack uh, on yourself, I think, actually, Nathan. But he did say it does happen. He can't deny that that happens. What I have found is happening on their side is one of the arguments I made against um, uh, their electrostatics was the fact that this thing does happen within canisters where there is a phase, there is must be some phase change happening towards the bottom of canisters with different gases in it of different molecular weights. And what's happening is the denser is always towards the bottom. When the gas canister is left to sit there at a constant temperature in a factory for whatever length of time. Right? Um, but the thing about it is, is that there was no talk about this on their side whatsoever. And now they're using this as a proof of electrostatics. That's, I've heard it two or three times now out of them. They use, I, I think it was on the Zachary Zabala show there a few nights ago that Anthony uh, shared that Bob is actually speaking and he does speak about this. So now they're using this exact thing as proof of electrostatic downward bias or whatever. Sure. Well, it's just phase changes. Okay, well, these you know, you can call them idealized or man-made or forced or whatever you like. These circumstances aren't what happens in nature. And that's what we're talking about when you apply these. Well, it's happening like this in this controlled circumstance. Therefore, nature behaves like, no, it doesn't. Nature adheres to natural law. Entropy increase will always occur. Now, Adam's twice on this show gone over this in terms of how high pressure gases which arbitrarily get described as fluids right we're talking about the dynamics of fluids correct adam well you know this is something that i often mix up in terms of my vernacular or my incorrect english when i say liquids versus fluids well your fluid dynamics are applicable under certain circumstances that aren't how gas behaves in nature so it does you can go down this road and be correct you know Anthony and i had this discussion this morning but Anthony was quick to point out to me that it's not on topic. It's not relevant. It doesn't matter what you you know how you can force a gas to behave and what you can attribute to it, because we're talking about how nature behaves. So in terms the, of how nature the, behaves, the sorry. laws of the, nature apply. The fluid dynamics when we're talking about gases, when even when you're talking about gases in the air and you know um, weather systems and that. Um, they're very they talk about they basically they're still discussing at the fundamental level diffusion um as one thing goes into another both liquids and gases but as you can understand the different way in which liquids and gases are composed uh, that's a wholly different way in which the two things diffuse liquids are so, a, a, a physical contact and whereas diffusion within a gas is kind of is 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 determined by that that random collision again it's a 
intermixing of, of diffusion slowly, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards in the, the content. It, it's a very different type of diffusion. Um, but they would still use that uh, um, description, Nathan, but it's... Uh, but with that fundamental understanding it's of, of, of the difference in the two actual dynamics of the systems. Brian, are you there? Yes, definitely, yes. Let me just correct you on some of what you said about Bob. He did say um, if you have a container and bleed all the gas into it, it would go into the container and fill the volume. He did say that, but the bit you missed off is the most important bit that he says. He goes on to say, after a while, what will happen is the gas collisions will eventually begin to slow, become ve less violent as that energy is depleted out of that initial energy transfer, and the gas will begin to settle and start taking on a density gradient bottom first but he emphasizes the bottom first now what he's doing there is he's focusing on the density gradient bottom first but he's attributing it to a loss of momentum caused by the collisions but if he doesn't realize that the collisions are elastic and there is no net loss of energy so he's saying that there is a loss let a net loss of energy and that's the cause of the gradient but that's not the cause of the gradient so he's incorrect so that was what i corrected him on him if you go back to 30 minutes into the live hangout yeah. today you'll see me d deal with that point directly uh, go there. no i know i didn't miss any of that no i'm just making the point to nathan that he does actually admit that that does happen oh, i know about that i know well, about the he, electric, yeah, electric collisions yeah. so he admits that there. happens but it's only a precursor to his next point, which is he's dependent, he's relying on the density gradient that he calls it at the bottom to be caused by the loss of momentum because the collisions are non-elastic. Hold, hold on, hold on. So although what's he happening, it, he's, then, so, he's then using that to hold support on, his Anthony, future we heard it twice, please. So we've heard the false comparison. So in terms of what we have in nature, you have gas created at ground level dissipating as they go up. Less of it created in the sky than there is on the ground, therefore less of it up high than there is down low. That's your pressure gradient, right? Not the mixture of gases or anything else before anybody distracts with that red herring. Now, Can you've I then got it being compared, by example, oh. to gas being injected into containment and then saying that over time that will form a homogeneous layer. No, it won't. The gas will just completely stay in that chamber that's sealed and just bounce around indefinitely. So in terms of your, uh, like the example that guy does, I've forgotten the name of him, and he's got bromine in one chamber and uh, uh, an empty vacuum in the other, he releases the bromine into the two chambers. Now, assuming that we have perfect seals, which you wouldn't have, in those in that apparatus, then essentially it will just stay like that. It's not like you leave it, come back a year later, and, oh, look, all the bromine settled on the bottom. No. It just remains a gas. <laughs> can, I, can I just, this is the... Yeah, but we are in a continuum. I want to address Sorry, on, on this, um, with regards to this. So, the, the, the claim is this is that there is an acting downward force which causes a decrease in the kinetic energy. Now, f fair enough, if, if, we, if we accept that, then the claim then becomes that we've got molecules that are going slower. Now we can do. We could demonstrate that a slowing of the molecules by just lowering the temperature. I'm I'm confused as to why slower molecules mean they'll have random collisions at a slower rate, which means they congregate at the bottom. Even uh, stop, stop! stop. I can tell you why. Occurs. Stop! 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 I can tell you why. Because you started that by disclaiming the begging the question fallacy that has to precede your example. So if we but, accept but, a downward bias, was your first opening gambit? No, 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 I'm, I'm saying uh, no. So if even if we're claiming that a downward bias <coughs> is a net of force applied, that what it does... You just did the same thing! I'm, I'm, no, 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 no. <laughs> let, me get, let me get past it. You just, it's you just violated the second law again. I know, I know I am. I'm just... just Bear with. Bear Hold on. With. So now you're going to say, I know I'm begging the question, but if you can, <laughs> quote, bear with me and beg the question with me. Yeah, Wits, no, it tried no. this. Yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. What I'm trying to say no. is the net effect of this, this is a, a supposed reduction in the speed of the molecule. What I'm saying is that reduction in the speed of the molecule does not eluc elucidate the, effect, the then claimed cause that you get congregation. Yeah. You've ah, just got ah, stop, stop, stop. The claim cause of what? The effect you've made us assume yeah. occurs. Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Well, we so don't even, assume it. Even if you even if you allowed the begging of the question and the net result of this begging the question, the result on the molecule doesn't result on the claim of pooling, is the point I'm making. Okay, so you're saying even if I beg the question, that they'll slow yeah. down with this description given by Bob. And yes. ignoring elastic collisions, begging the question of a downward vector, you still don't have a hom homogeneous layer forming at the bottom of a bromine container if you leave it on the desk for a year. Yeah. I'm I'm Billy the bromine molecule, right? And I'm 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 there. Yeah. I am. I'm I'm flying around my cylinder, and for whatever reason, reduction in temperature or a, a, a force that takes away my my speed. Yeah, I'm flying around now. At the moment, I'm going around at ten mile an hour, and I hit the top, and I, and then I just ping off to the side, and I ping off to the other side. Eventually, I hit the bottom, I ping around, I ping around. Now I'm doing that at ten mile an hour. Now I'm doing it at five mile an hour. What, 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 what's the difference in terms of the probability of where I hit when I hit it? Gotcha. It's I'm the same. So, okay, 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 I gotcha. Hour. I got you. All, so, all I'm going to do is generate less pressure because I'm going slower. So my number of collisions is reduced because I'm traveling slower. That's the right. only difference. Where I end up is just as probable to the randomness of the collisions. Gotcha. So it's, hey, akin, to, it's akin to saying as you oh, went up on. higher. Hey, and Nathan, it got... don't close that. I want to add something. I'll be back in a couple minutes. I uh, know I'm closing out right now. Do you want to add it now? Some bitch. Don't swear. Nah, I gotta go get breakfast. Oh, this is all Dunning Kruger nonsense, anyway. Um, <laughs> first of all, you got the container now. The collisions, the elastic collisions between the molecules, th those are elastic. There's no net loss of energy, but you gotta understand the boundary conditions also, which you're not forgetting. Now, this is a red herring fallacy because you're inside the container. Now, the molecules hitting the walls of the container are gonna impart some energy to the container walls, right? Where are the container walls on the earth? Number one. Like, like I said, number two, this is an incoherent red herring Dunning-Kruger fallacy. Right? Yeah, I'll be out in a minute. Um, how was I going to end this? You guys put the pressure on me. I'm tired of this, man. I want to relax. <laughs> Got 16 right. seconds. Are you still with me? Got 16 seconds to round out. Right. Yeah. So... The kinetic energy of gases is not due to any frigging, whoa, what are they saying? Like conservation of momentum or something? What are they going to conjure up with that? That ain't going to work, you numpties. It's dependent on the temperature of the gas. Pounds, not you guys. Well, I have a question. I know you're trying to run it, but I have to have a question. One of the things I brought up, John, was that the temperatures of vibration rate of the molecules. But will reducing the temperature reduce the velocity and direction or the or, or directional velocity of the particle? Do you understand the nature of my question? I think he's legged it to breakfast as soon as he made out his point. But yeah, it'll slow it down, is what you're asking, right? Will it slow it down? Yeah, it'll slow it down. That's what it that's what it's doing. So it will slow down the direction and velocity of the particle. The vibrational rate, when it reduces, will slow down the direction and velocity of the particle. So how does it do that? They don't vibrate. I, I, just, I did a quick look up on that. Um, vibration tends to be more within lattice structures that uh, any in, in, in ingested energy translates as vibrational energy. Within gases, very little change in vibrational energy of the molecule. It's mostly translated any input of energy as kinetic. kinetic. Right, so if you imagine those three different states that QE has in those little circles, when it's trying to fly off, i.e. it's part of a liquid with a weak bond, it's vibrating because it's trying to fly off. But once it's changed state into a gas, it just flies in at the direction it's flying in until it hits something. It's not vibrating anymore, is what you're saying, right? Well, well here's my question. Then. Once that particle leaves the container, it's got all that kinetic energy. You're saying... That, but as the temperature of that particle reduces, the velocity of that particle reduces. Yes. As it's even though it's not colliding with anything. Yeah, it's still flying at a slightly lower speed in all directions, and as you go higher and there's less of them, i.e., there's less to smack on the walls of the container, that will also in turn reduce the pressure, the amount and speed and velocity. Those all th those will all have a bearing on the amount of pressure. 
Okay, I think I, my point, I don't know if I'm, my point's been made. I'm talking about if it's not in a contained system, that particle left, left the system, it's not colliding with anything, it's not in contact with anything, but the temperature of it is reduced because the vibrational rate is reducing. You're saying the speed of that and its directional, directional velocity is also reducing. Yeah, but you can't qualify that in terms of the difference it would make to the pressure because it's never going to collide with anything. But you're talking about a, a circumstance where you have no containment i.e. just expands in all directions and never hits anything ever? Right, it's, it's the, but the, see the, okay, of course Lily is screaming. It's the, I just want to, Lily, I'm, I'm talking, okay? If you don't stop, I'm going to put you in time out, please. No, I don't want to. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I got a ball, just to, Feel free. The okay, screaming I'm sorry. Okay with but I just don't want to. I mean, if you if you if you use the molecular theory, that that energy or that velocity or whatever conservation momentum, if you want to call it that, has to go somewhere. Where is it going? I thought you were closing out. I don't get what you're saying, man. You saying theoretically, if the particle just could continue on unimpeded, would it slow down? If, if that's the question, then I'd say no. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's the question. So that's what you have to say. If they say the connection. But it's a very theoretical the question. It's testable, isn't it? It, re it requires the vacuum of space. Well, that's what I was right, going exactly. that, that was where I was going, Adam, exactly. So what, what, what I was going to say to you next, Paul, was where would you give this example, or how would you give this example in reality? Because you would require a circumstance that has no containment. Well, other than the assumption of a sky vacuum, which is violated by the second law of thermodynamics, then how are you going to make the example where a, a particle just dissipates out from wherever it came and then just carries on indefinitely? And you're saying, if that happens, what happens to its speed? Well, Adam's saying no, well, it wouldn't slow down. But in terms of as something's being cooled in your first example, Adam, what does that manifest as in terms of a loss of energy? Well, how would that manifest? Now, we just revert to PV equals NRT. So, yeah, so that basically you've got a, a, a reduction in, in the speed of the molecule, which translates as a reduction in pressure, wouldn't it? So if you think about a balloon and you blow it up and then you cool it significantly, it will shrink. Sure, but what, what I'm trying to get, yeah, I agree. And what I'm trying to say to Paul is, without the qualifier, the pressure bit, how do you qualify it? Well, Adam said, well, he, he slipped it in anyway. He said the change in the speed, <laughs> right? But that's qualifiable by the amount of pressure on the containment. So that's how you qualify it. But if you've got your example where there's no containment, you can't qualify it. I got you. And, and see, when, I think, too, once you lose that vibrational kinetic energy, the bonds start taking over, right? The bonds of the molecules. Would you agree? What causes you mean it will, it to yeah, well, gas and liquid? Well, that's directly proportional to temperature. If you take the example of water, right, you're saying it'll condense. It'll form weak right, bonds and turn into liquid. Right. Right. Yeah. Phase change. I'm done. I'm, I'm still getting screamed at. I'm done. Did you want to add something, QE? Because I have kept the... I'm not going to round out on a nice and even time by the looks of this. <laughs> oh, you're still on. And I... Yeah. Yes. See, yes. so man, you made me hurry up. Now I'm relaxing and eating. Now you want me to close out? No, no. I'm saying I might keep the show open for another eight minutes. <laughs> Yeah, right back what I was saying. I knew, like I said, this is an incoherent Dunning-Kruger red herring fallacy, but in this, in the, <laughs> no pun intended, the boundaries, right? Now, the elastic collisions between the gases, and, and Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, which I'm not. The collisions between the molecules, they're elastic. However, when those gas molecules hit the boundary or hit the barrier, it will impart some of its energy to that barrier. Yeah, and yeah. then that barrier, what that's connected to, whether it be an adiabatic wall, right? Or so this goes into quite some detail, and I don't think I need to go that far. No. What I'm saying here is it's an incoherent Dunning Kruger red herring fallacy because they're talking about vacuum chambers and chambers and canisters and stuff. What? Where's the canister on the Earth? That ends it right there. 
I, 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 I don't, don't know. Maybe, am I yeah, missing something? Or some kind. Am I oh, missing yeah. something? something? Yeah, we're oh. in a we're in a container of some kind, aren't we? The the, the uh, no, no 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 stop 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 stop, stop, stop. John. no no you, you've, you've... Oh, hold on Adam no, that's not what he said he said where's the canister around Earth that's what he specifically said you're going to compare no, Earth to you... a, a spray can an aerosol can yeah. right then we need to be comparable in nature and we're not. Now, does that mean we're not we're saying suddenly that there is no containment? No, no, there absolutely must be containment. But is that comparable to a canister? To to make it comparable is is to make it the whole of every of creation is, and your canister. You'd have to be a bit like when when Zach did his experiment where we showed differential and gas pressure you'd have to be running around with your your blowtorch being the sun which is the big stirring rod in your already dynamic system which is adding energy to those 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 molecules which is making them behave dynamically and differently as you agitate them now john made the point about the the sides of the wall maybe there is that maybe there isn't but there's such a big other influence that we don't even see that at the top end we see we see the effects of the the uh, of of the the container on the ground we see condensation happening we see water vapor coming off we can see those things yes if you want to get into the detail of course the container uh, has to play a role it's the thing that generates the pressure and there is some movement of kin kinetic energy but in a much bigger reality when we are trying to figure out the natural world, yeah, we have a much bigger input, uh, and the in terms of the dynamicness of the system. So the, any supposed concern with regards to kinetic energy loss through temperature transference is massively negated by the dynamic system and the input that we have from the sun. Yeah, I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying. I was just inside their canister, which is what three inches in diameter. I understand it's it's it doesn't have anything to do with it, well, right? If, if, if we're talking about the Earth and its container, this is massive, right? And far, we don't even know where it is, right? However, the sun's in it, inside heating everything up, so. And, it's not only negligible. That's why I said it's a red, incoherent, red herring fallacy, Dunning Kruger type. The, Got it. The only bit I'd add, John, is if if that canister was in a temperature controlled room and the gas inside was at the same temperature as the canister and we kept the room the same temperature, then those gas molecules keep moving at the same. Speed. That's true. That's correct. Which follows a normal distribution. They're not all going the same speed, by the way. It follows a right. normal distribution. It's the square of the right. sum of, of, of it. They're not because it's totally interactive. Yeah, it, it, it is an approximation. It, it, I, I'm sure, pretty sure. sure it's a and further a, a to that distribution. It's a statistical. Yeah, yeah. It's a statistical yeah. thing. Again, yeah. But further yeah. to that, yeah. Adam's Adam's point where you, when you slept off to breakfast, I think, was that you've got uh, no instance, even in that controlled circumstance, where you have a layer forming. Where, where are we talking about? Gas. No, where? In a can in a canister, regardless if you scale oh, it in up one of those small it. canisters, right? Yeah. So, that, like I said, this is a, it's incoherent red herring. It's it's simple as that. Okie dokie. I think I will like to round out on. So, with that, I'll say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and Google Panels for making today's after show possible, and of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley nineteen eighty or Nathan Oakley Primary Extremes for hopefully smashing the super chat liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Be sure to check out NathanOakley.com and the Flat Earth Debate Forum to keep up to date with the community debate. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video.